uh, in transporters because he's tied himself to the console. They had to move it. <laughs> uh, yes, that is indeed what your dark matter... Well, it's actually very close to what I pictured anyway because yeah. it's described as a Taurus, which is a... What is it? That's kind of like a... I, I remember having a look what a Taurus was. Well, I assume so that the spikes a, are there. Like a <laughs> twisty... <an> empty disc. <laughs> yeah. Twisty disc. Uh, I assumed Stevens was getting the job. But oh, I took me Bravo is still a cartography. <laughs> it's Bravo is still a cartography in there. Why is he there? Because we needed a Bravo. <laughs> well, there is that other Bravo that folks forget is actually there, and that's Science Bravo. Yeah, but no one likes Science Bravo. Oh, that's Science Bravo. Always going where he's not wanted. Oh, bugger! Ah, yes, that was it, that was it, that was it. Spinning subspace field to quantum spin, right, okay. That was it, that was it. I found the pseudoscience, it's alright. <laughs> we can all relax. Right, we've got both warp cores running. The well, ship we'll is get coming to that in, the in right just direction. a moment, but first, <laughs> um, I'm just going to confirm that everyone is in foundry and can see everything including their altered the altered names of their characters yes, or some of I them have got altered names actually my name's still the same <laughs> most of them have got <laughs> yeah. there's only two of them who've got altered names I'll have yeah, yeah, so, so. <laughs> you we'll get probably to that change yours, yeah. <laughs> I'll turn off the ship rumble in the meantime everyone who wants to be on Sirenscape can hear it Yep. Oh, then I shall turn it on. And we shall move ourselves over to the intro video, which will become slightly ironic in a moment. Nevertheless, um, we will be back in a couple of seconds, folks, so don't go away. I'll see you in a minute. <clears throat> There we go. folks, and welcome along to the continuing adventures of the USS Navis. I'm MJ the GM, and I will be your Games Master for the next three hours, and with me are the majority of the Navis crew. We Hello. are sadly Honk. without our Chief Science Officer for tonight, so we wish him all the best, and we will see him next week. In the Sadly, meantime, he left the door open and he escaped. If you happen to see him, please call this number flashing in front of your screen now. <laughs> You'll be able to tell his passage through the amount of uh, uh, screaming and sexually aroused women and men who will be pursuing him at great speed. I'm so glad that you said sexually aroused then. <laughs> uh, sorry for talking hey. to you. I just had to get in there with that one. Oh, God. Nevertheless, the first thing we're going to plug today is, as you can tell, just from looking at our landing page, um, the guys were up to some interesting shenanigans last week when we should have been doing the Navis, but sadly I was um, held up ill and so couldn't run the session, and so uh, Sean very uh, nicely stepped in in order to host a, uh, a new game that hasn't been tried yet. One honk before midnight? A goose-based TTRPG adventure. A 
Apparently, it was a right laugh riot. Here's the uh, Kickstarter page. Page the feathered one. <laughs> the one. No, no, well, feathered. <laughs> Tell one old chap, we did bloody good with that damn thing. So, here's the page of the Kickstarter. The guy, these guys seemed to enjoy it immensely from the sheer amount of chaotic messages I saw in the Discord server. And as you can see here, they've left behind a bit of a, shall we say, mark on our landing page, so I thought I would just leave it there so that we could get a good uh, <clears throat> a good glimpse as to the kind of these silly shenanigans that may or may not have gone on in my absence. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thanks again to Sean for running that, and by the sounds of it, you guys had a blast. So maybe even a literal blast from what I hear. Who got the actual blast, I believe, was the mayor. <laughs> that, will, that will teach him to defy the will of geese kind. But geese was never an option. <laughs> yes. However, we gave him for geese, not peace. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Is a goose loose about this use? We're By gonna way, take them down. As you can tell, a lot of fun was had. <laughs> but today we're back uh, on course and on mission with Star Trek Adventures Navis. Um, one quick plug I'm going to do, even though I'm not affiliated with um, Modia Fierce, is that they recently, at last, released the uh, Klingon Federation War module supplement, which they've been hinting uh, was coming for a good bit now, and I've been eagerly awaiting it, and now I've got it at last. And it's got some interesting stuff in there. Obviously, a lot of it is, uh, especially the pre-written stuff, missions and whatnot, are tailored towards the Klingon Federation War that was shown to start uh, on the, f the first season of Star Trek Discovery, but it can be altered with very little uh, effort to be pretty much any large-scale conflict, so I am looking to use that when we finally move into the Dominion War. So hopefully... What war? Uh, Nothing's gonna happen, it's peace. Exactly, exactly. You're gonna turn the Dominion tables, peace. you're gonna teach that... You're gonna teach those people that, you know, we, you don't wanna mess with us, you really don't. We'll just yeah. park the Navis outside the wormhole and be like, hello! <laughs> line up single file, bang! Yeah. <laughs> no, just line up your entire fleet, we'll take them on in one go. No, you're trying to go for a trick shot. One torpedo is a whole lot. <laughs> Granted, it will collapse the wormhole into the Gamma Quadrant, but hey, we'll deal with the re religious reaper and spatial repercussions later. Chief Medical Officer's log. You drop one esoteric bit of moss into a great uh, link of an entire shapeshifting species, and then you accuse the start of the war through bioweaponry. <laughs> I like it how you turn Welch at the end then. <laughs> Bioweaponry! <laughs> but. Bioweaponry to be sure. First officer's log, this is the first time I've had to confiscate bioweaponry under a request from the time place? <laughs> okay, and I never realised they were based out of the Tau Shiar as well. Right. Yeah. Never Not mind. The time, please, that was the towel, please. <laughs> well, either way, we'll be looking to use some, any, or all of that, uh, depending on what what we feel works and what doesn't. So, um, looking forward to getting to use some of that, if and when we get the chance. In the meantime, uh, we are starting a new episode today, so. Why don't we get straight to it? Obviously, since um, the Akira-class Navis was damaged quite extensively, you guys have had some uh, shore leave awarded whilst you basically wait for your ship to be fixed, if it can be fixed at all. And what with the uh, situation with... Uh, the Venture and the Bellerophon, which we will get to in a little bit, um, things are looking a bit spare, as it were, on Narendra Station at the moment. As such, folks who have got science experiments they were doing can feel free to do so. Uh, we were partway through Dr. Bertram's use of airborne silicates to bond with gases to make a breathable atmosphere. 
in a short range around an individual, i.e. plant-based EVA suits. And we were closing in on uh, the latest attempt to create the holographic infiltration torpedoes. Yep. So we've still got stuff to do. So who basically wants to go first? In that case, I will nominate Dr. Bertram. Okay. To the xenobiology. <laughs> I believe um, Ori was um, helping me with this as well. Cool. Uh, was anybody else? I mean, what were we using? We were up to the... Uh, we were using Xenobiology, so yep. whatever we think has we got We currently had seven successes. So, supporting characters that might have Xenobiology. Uh, Fizal does not, because she's all about stellar phenomena and stuff. Jenny, Eric has only got Botany, so she's not really great for it. What Where about me? Nurse she, she's Bravo. banned from helping, though. Quiet. Unless Jean's on the research team as well. <laughs> um, Nurse Bravo doesn't have xenobiology, but does have a reasonably high medicine, so he could always help as well if he wanted him to. They wish they are. Bertram would say they are more than welcome to. Okay, I will pop Nurse Bravo in for a quick appearance on our landing page. Then, for that case. So, uh, if you're doing that, so can we have... Webby, why don't you take the reins of Ori, since uh, you mentioned it. And can we have maybe a Yan being a Nurse Bravo, please? We're going to be doing Reason plus Medicine for Bertram and Bravo, but we'll be approaching it from the science perspective from Ori. Uh, Xenoanthropology is a foci? Hmm. Xenobiology we're looking at here, so maybe genetics. Yes, that would be useful. Nice. Okay, one die. So one that dice is... for Bravo, one dice for Aura. Yes, Jan. Uh, reason and medicine and uh, folk guy. No focus really. He doesn't have anything close to xenobiology or anything like that, so it'll just be talent alone. Sheer talent. Sheer talent. Which you're used to, Jan, so yeah. There we are, see? One success. And Bertram is using a determination, as per usual. As per usual. So we have racked up an impressive six successes. Bowser. Which means we have gone from not not nearly halfway to very much nearly three quarters of the way through this current pursuit. Xenobiology. Looking good. Um, certainly in trying to come up with data that suggests how different biologies will interact with a plant-based means of generating a close breathable atmosphere um, not everybody breathes oxygen yeah um, so a certain amount of mix and match is going to be necessary hence yeah. the xenobiology um, avenue which yeah. is proving very very useful it does suggest that certain plant types from as wide around the Federation as you can possibly get samples of are needed to give a good example of what type of plant-based life forms go into creating the breathable atmospheres, if any do, on most of the Federation member species' home planets and colonies and whatnot. So this is proving interesting data at the very least in what kind of what kind of methods you'll need to use to refine down to the the base elements of what's needed. So, so far so good. Uh, like I said, getting close to three quarters of the way through this particular line of study. At the moment, lots of data collection, which is proving to be very useful indeed on giving you a, a rather substantial list of the various different plant types and gases they're going to need to um, create. So this is going to be... Interesting. Moving on, the holographic torpedo. We were currently looking into security protocols as a means of um, trying to solve our little project, yeah. mostly because security protocols are going to be needed to be overcome in order to fool 
an enemy ship's sensors that they are in fact being boarded by whatever the holographic torpedo is being programmed to make them think they're being boarded by. So, as triples such... Always triples. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> this anybody is why with it's taking a while protocols? it's stuck on Starfleet security protocols certainly can help, but anybody with knowledge of any kind of security protocols would definitely be useful. Vibus is of course the lead on this particular project, so those with uh, security based uh, assistance will more than likely be very useful on this. As such, let's find... Okra. Chief Okra Bravo. Chief of Security. Now he has general security protocols rather than Starfleet specific ones, so he would probably be very useful on this. Hmm. Me too, Whereas me too. uh and the Bassanan canal. as well has general security protocols, as opposed to Andrews who has Starfleet protocols specifically, so it seems the best ones to get the help from would be Thazanan and Bravo at this particular point. Yep. Okay then. So naturally, Yan gets to roll as uh, his primary character. So let's have uh, Alex, if you fancy being Chief Bravo here. Yeah. We're looking at the moment for reason and security. I know reason isn't Bravo's best score but you are trying to use smarts to uh, figure out how to implement this on a security torpedo protocol. no that's not bad. A focus. not bad at all. security protocols as a focus yes please okay just slightly outside of being able to meaningfully contribute but still his input is necessary however Caval points out a few things <laughs> Maybe we want to account for this and this. So it's five all dice to max, eyes. isn't it? Five dice max. You've already used two, so you've got three remaining, which can be filled with either. Well, it's probably going to be filled Captain, with a Captain, could I get an extra? Actually, yeah. I'll or, give, I'll or you can call in determination. Help. Absolutely. Uh, let's use determination. Be interesting. Uh, okay. Bada boom, bada bing! Five successes in total, very, very I've nice. been trained. Yeah. Alright, you locked in the, um, the, uh, what are they called? Simulations? And you've run them and you've come back with the data, and you've certainly made some very impressive strides. The right type of security protocols that you need in order to infiltrate the system, in order to fool it that it's being boarded has definitely yielded some really good results, but it's still uh, not quite it. There's still something missing. Even though you have got um, hot the holographics technology down, you've now also got the torpedo technology down, how to fit all this inside of a torpedo casing. Now you've got an idea of the kind of security protocols that need to be overcome. So hmm. the two areas of investigation that you have remaining are electronic warfare and infiltration. This going to probably be the warfare then. I think it might have to be the electronic warfare because this is quite an expensive torpedo to launch at somebody. It shouldn't really miss. Okay. In that case, <laughs> electronic warfare appears to be the way you're going to be going next, which should prove very interesting. You've covered a lot of ground with investigating this technology now, and you've made great strides, but now it's there's just something missing, and if electronic warfare is indeed the, the last hurdle that needs to be overcome, then you're closer than ever to, to finishing this project. This has been quite a long one. But you've investigated many different avenues and therefore I've got more of a complete picture, so that's kind of cool. At least I think so. So there we go. Mm. Those two projects. Any other projects anybody else wants to start? If they have any ideas uh, for some? I've, I do have one for the future, but not 
quite yet. Yeah, I don't think anything I need a few people to be freed up that are currently involved in there, it's namely a Vibers. Okay. Interesting. I think I've briefly mentioned it, turning it in uh, basically turning the uh, sound gun to uh, technology into a magnetic mine based off a probe design. So you can basically pilot it out, let it uh, sound magnetize probe. Uh, and then... sound mines basically then. Yeah, so basically you drive it out, magnetize it, something gets close, it'll attach, hack in, and then scan through basically for uh, markers that would identify what race it is, cycle through it, and just blast the interior with whatever sound would incapacitate. Intriguing. Certainly building upon the success you've already achieved with your previous two sound gun related um, projects, so logical. I like It'd it. be a bit more of a set it and forget it type thing, so we can literally just throw it out. If it doesn't get used, we can always pick it back up. Or oh, uh, multiple. Pick them back up at the end of the uh, encounter. And interestingly <laughs> enough, because it's entirely non-lethal and meant, meant to incapacitate rather than kill, um, they kind of shirk around the whole big uh, moral no-no of using mines in, uh, in warfare. Even though that was already overcome when um, Starfleet asked, or, or Ben Sisko, Captain Ben Sisko, mined the wormhole entrance, or he's about to anyway. So we're a bit, um, we're a bit away from that actual ha actually happening in our in-game canon at the moment. So yeah, Sisko and war crimes probably go, not the one to talk about. <laughs> Not the one to hold what? up as an example. All right, gotcha. We're surely not going to talk about Ben Warcrime Cisco. <laughs> you don't poison two pilots just to get them to swap occupants. Well, not with that attitude, you do. I mean, no, that would be a bad thing. <laughs> okay. First officer's log. Note to self: Please talk to your medical officer about the ethics tribunal. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Before that's not they something... come to visit. <laughs> that's not something Bertrand would said. That was totally a gaffer. <laughs> I'm know. in the log, dear Bert, uh, dear Captain. <laughs> I murdered an Orion. Love Bertram. Kiss. <laughs> so... I did not murder an Orion. He blew himself up. Exactly. I don't see what to say. You didn't even kiss. You poisoned him with radiation. <laughs> no, 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 I killed the plants he was holding as hostage with <laughs> radiation. Actually, we can never have him do negotiations. Speaking of that, Matt, do I remember right in you saying, uh, from what Bertram saw, one canister of mycelium spores was missing? Silence is devastating. Or am I misremembering that, Matt? No, you're not misremembering it. You are totally correct. There was one canister of mycelium spores missing. Yeah, that's okay. Now, um... They're only what, little, what's the worst they could do? Well, I, I, um, just to let you know, Matt, I'm thinking once I finish the current project, um, Bertram's probably going to start researching the mycelium realm and stuff to... Basically, just in case the Orions decide to start to try and use it to increase their... Um, what Thank do you, you call sure. it? Uh, yes, in case <laughs> they start dabbling in their Empire own um, yeah. propulsion drive, yeah. Good yeah. Point. Made. Yeah. Okay. Um, do I also remember right the you said something like I had some large milestones I needed to use? I didn't say need to use. What I intimated was that uh, folks had saved some up and not used them. As such, if they were looking for something to use such things on, they could help pimp up some parts of your your um well you know it's coming, your new ship. Yeah. Uh, so there's that um, option. Don't feel yeah. obliged to do, of course, yeah. until you know what it is you're getting into, but yeah. that's Actually, what I was trying probably, to get at. Yeah, it probably won't be relevant for this session yet, but I might use one on giving myself a mycelium realm related focus for later for Bertram's work on that. Yeah, absolutely. You can give yourself yep. um, extra extra stuff with, yep. uh, with large milestones. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, cool. Thank you. Okay, anybody else with any questions or anything that they think uh, they need reminding of? No, oh, cool. Excellent. <laughs> they tasted delicious, the mycelial realm, what a discovery. 
Nice. Okay, moving on. So we're going to place our scene. Hang on a second, I gotta read this. <laughs> okay, so like I said, the Navis crew have been on basically at Narendra Station doing pretty much nothing, mu nothing for the past week or so, whilst, um, of course, their ship has been towed away to get uh, repaired and refit um, in a proper shipyard rather than being uh, just plain old patched up at Narendra Station since the damage was more extensive than Narendra Station has the facilities to cater for. So, we join our stars at Narendra Station and a certain uh, blue-skinned and antennae chief helm officer is brought around from brought around from sleep by a very familiar female voice who yanks the covers off of him and goes come on flyby get up and she gives him a nudge as she switches on the lights to the room what what's what's, what's going on come on flyby get up you're late the admiral has asked for the uh, the uh, senior bridge officers of the Navis to join her on the gallery. Yeah, come on. You gotta get up. You gotta get in the sonic shower. You gotta get dressed. Let's go. Seriously? Seriously? Ten minutes. Come on. Fine. Now, Caval, as he's begrudgingly getting up, notices that there's a particular twitch to Shore's antennae that suggests that she knows something and she's keeping quiet about it. She really, really wants to say something, but she obviously is refusing to. She's acting they better be Erectogenos. <laughs> what was that, sorry? They better be Erectogenos. <laughs> Sadly, it looks like Shore is gathering up her stuff from um, where she left it in, because um, currently in your own quarters. She's gathering up a data pad and is putting on her comm badge. Right, I have to go meet the Admiral, so we will meet you on the Galleria. Come on, chop chop! She just turns around and yeah. sashays out. And the second half of the scene, bound chicka wow wow! Well, you may be more right than you know, because in a couple of minutes that it takes for Caval to get dressed, uh, find his comm badge, and stumble out of his uh, out of his quarters at the same time, because the officers' quarters are all on the same level. As soon as Caval exits his own quarters, uh, he hears the the hiss of another door opening nearby, and Ori walks out of his own quarters, straightening his <laughs> uniform. At which point he turns and notices uh, Caval and gives gives his fellow officer a wave. But then he stands back as a Darbo girl exits his quarters. Followed by another Darbo girl. Followed by a Klingon, a female Klingon service member. Followed by a Girl's male and female Starfleet ensign. Well, <laughs> <laughs> just raises an eyebrow. And they all kind of file out own, past. Is he coming with his own biohazard warning? May contain STDs. <laughs> May contain traces of nuts. <laughs> um, he does if you don't read the personnel file. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, but you know, an obvious tag on him. The Darbo girls smile as they go past. The Klingon is still straightening her collar. The the two ensigns, as they walk past, look a bit embarrassed and try not to meet Caval's eyes as as he acknowledges them as they go past. They just go, <coughs> Commander? It's a... <laughs> then Ori just kind of saunters up sexily to, uh, <laughs> to Caval. I think we've got a meeting to go to. Any idea what it's about? Nope. So, it's, you know... It's just gonna be... It's just, just yeah. Ori, yeah. right, with his usual big old grin. Go on, sorry, yeah. It's going to be one of those wait and see ones. Mm. Indeed, Ori scuttles sexily on. So just as <laughs> yes, we we made the scuttling sexily, didn't we? Yes, we did. So as um, 
Orai and Thazanan get onto the uh, onto the turbo lift. There is just as the doors are closing. You hear hold the li hold the lift. As Ensign Fizal comes in with her arms linked around two of her Bravo husbands, the other three also file in at the same time. The turbo lift is now a little crowded, but there's room enough for everybody, and everybody just stands around and the turbo lift resumes its course towards the Galleria. Caval's thoughts, of yep. course, are going along to the uh, the question of was Shure hiding, I wonder. At which We've point... We've got quite a monogamous uh, ship, haven't we? Am I doing something wrong? Well, um, one of the Bravos, let's go, Okra, Chief of Security, kind of turns around as um, Thazanan thinks this and just says, um, everything all right, Commander? Uh, yes, yes, I just seem to be uh, out of the loop in terms of what's happening. It's funny you should say that, Commander, because, well, and he looks at his brothers who are all giving him a similar sidelong look. We're getting similar kind of sense off of some of the other seniors. S some of the senior officers' minds, they're, 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 they're deliberately hiding their thoughts. Something's up, and obviously, well, you may or may not have a similar inclination. We might be picking up totally different things, of course. It's probably nothing. <laughs> And so the turbo lift resumes, uh, finally ends its uh, its passage, and you open up onto the Galleria, which is a lot more populous than you remember it being in quite some time. In fact, as uh, Thazanan, Ori, and the uh, the Bravos and uh, Fizal all make their way towards where they can see the other senior officers all gathered at one of the um, one of the what do you call them? They're not windows, they're kind of lookout ports, as it were. Port hall. Port hall, isn't it? Port windows, or whatever you call them. Um, uh, Watching so, places. Yes. Bertram, Watching Nova, <laughs> Andrews, Vibers, Edwards, they're all there. They've, uh, some of them are clustered together. Vibers is coming along with a team of um, Klingons, and... Um, Vibers kind of joins the rest of the group as he goes, uh, as he seems to finish the story he was telling the Klingons. At which point, it's something along the lines of, All right, all right, fine. I'll give you the money, but the Targ in the tutu has to go. And the Klingons all erupt in laughter. At which point, they all give okay, Vibers a slap the time, on the shoulder. I was about 5'2, <laughs> and it's a lot more impressive at the time. <laughs> Nevertheless, the Klingon officers give Vipers a, a happy slap along the back and move off. So, everybody's all assembled near the, uh, the, the port windows looking out over space. You can see certain ships passing, coming and going, because this place is still a merchant hub as much as anything else. But, there are a lot of people about today going to and fro, most of them in uniform, which is no surprise, but... You're constantly bumping into somebody who apologizes on their way past. Eventually, we are joined by Admiral Hebert and um, her assistant, Shore. Hebert has got about three data pads held in the crook of her arm, and as she approaches you all, she goes, Good, you're all here. If you will uh, follow me, we'll walk and talk. So as a group, you all come forward. Naturally, Captain Andrews kind of proceeds the lot of you as um, he kind of walks up beside the Admiral. So, as you have probably heard on the grapevine, the situation here with, at the very least, man and ship power is not great. Now, obviously, the three ships that we had posted here weren't the entirety of the 20th Fleet, but they were the ones that were posted here for the express purpose of exploring the Shackleton Expanse. Well, news so far is that the Venture is still looking to complete the uh, 
repairs that they had done on her in order, after the escapade with the Romulans and the planet Oregon 3 coming through that rupture in space. Plus, I kind of get the feeling that um, Captain Corbett is trying to put some emotional distance between himself and his crew and the loss of their, uh, their, uh, their first officer. But it seems that Captain Benjamin Sisko up on Deep Space Nine is pulling his usual favors of asking his old buddy, Captain Corbett's ship, to be on standby in case Deep Space Nine needs them, what with things starting to get a bit tense around the Bajoran wormhole these days. And our favorite Starfleet Captain Blackford is of course always putting in the fact that he wants to be anybody anywhere else but here very least under the command of anybody else but me. So Blackford is taking any excuse he can in order to be away from the station. As a result, they're our only ship at present because the Navis, our warship, or security ship as I like to think of it, has been put temporarily, if not indefinitely, out of commission, which leaves us rather short-handed, or rather short-shipped. Now, as you guys are proceeding onwards through the crowds, the amount of people hurrying past you is still increasing. But you also notice that there are a good number of civilians who are starting to run in the same direction that you are going and seem to be crowding around the viewports. However, we do have a bit of good news in that regard. With our only security ship being out of commission, I had to pull a few strings in order to try and get them to send us a replacement, and the good news is, we got one. And Admiral Hebert gestures towards the viewport, and sure enough, they're just pulling up. Probably not as good as the Nevis. I beg your pardon, sorry? Cavell's like, it's probably not as good as the Nevis, before, <laughs> before he looks out the window. And then you get a eyeful of your new ship. This incredible cross between a galaxy class and some sleek design elements which are currently into going into making something akin to the Sovereign. And it's there being towed in. And there's lots of excited uh, looks on everybody's faces as they're all as civilians and um, resident Starfleet officers, and some Klingon ones too, alike, are crowding around the viewports to get a good look at this new magnificent ship that's coming in. This is your new ship. And uh, Hebert hands over to Andrews the first data pad with the schematic and rundown of the ship. Now, there's good news, and there's bad news. The good news is, she's fresh off the line, and has at least come out of the testing phase. But, that's not to say that she is fully ready. She needs some shakedown time. Commander Vibers, at the very least, gets his long-standing wish that you get a ship with dual warp cores. Well, there she is. A close cousin of the Phalanx class, this is the newly anticipated Yggdrasil class. Class of ship designed purely for the testing of new propulsion systems. We were able to get her out of dry dock thanks to the amount of people that apparently seem to hold you guys in quite high favour. Not the least of which was a very particular Andrews. admiral. Sending that ale to the Utopia Planet ship would go down well. <laughs> what How ale? How do you do well? Right, people. <laughs> <laughs> no comment, sir. Well, as it turns out, Commander Vibers, one of your uh, previous connections appears to have extended something of some extra favours in our direction. When uh, he heard that we were being sent a new ship for your use, he insisted that the new propulsion system be based on your previous efforts to create a 
a very quick and dirty method of mirroring the, tr the propulsion method of the displacement activated spore drive and as such they've christened it the Bifrost Dark Matter Drive. So congratulations. You guys get to be the first test pilots of a brand new Dark Matter Dark Matter Drive. I assume it's stable, Admiral. Well, and she hands over the second data pad. <clears throat> That's for you to test Ooh. and find out, Captain. Who cares? How fast does it go? <laughs> um, let's go with yes. As far as that goes, that's a very uh, good point. Actually, let me bring up the specs. <clears throat> it's funny you mention stuff like uh, speed and specifications, Commander Thazanan, because, well, that's the reason why we've got quite a crowded station today. Now, this baby has got a uh, cruising speed of warp 6. Maximum speed of warp 9.975, utilizing both its warp cores in order to enable it to be a very fast insector response vessel. But, like I said, it's a close cousin of the Phalanx class, so it comes with all the pluses and minuses of such a very fast but very powerful ship. Let's just say that your operations officer, Lieutenant Nova, is going to have quite an interesting time of things. Same goes for your engineering staff. Your current, your former crew complement was around 500. Your new ship is now taking on a complement of 800. That's why we have a lot of new arrivals here today, and that's why Lieutenant Shore and myself, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, that my chief, my assistant Shore and myself have had to deal with a lot of, shall we say, logistics during the last couple of days. Getting you some new recruits. And that's where the final piece of news comes in. And she hands over the third and final data pad. It seems that a certain Klingon captain affiliated with ourselves has pulled a few favors, and in light of the increasing tensions with the Dominion recently, and the fact that a, a f previously mentioned Starfleet captain has also had similar favors performed, Captain Akul has managed to pull some influence with his government and has afforded us the use of a Klingon-made cloaking device for use on our new ship. That is why we are getting former Chief Engineer Keth of the Mapui as a semi-permanent transfer in order to allocate the amount of Klingon crew necessary that this qualifies as something of an exchange program. So, we have a number of Starfleet and Klingon crew to get through in the next couple of days in order to perform our shakedown cruise of the new Navis A. So, Captain, Commanders, would you care to join me on a brief uh, introduction onto your new ship? Introduction was not the word Matt wanted to use there. Tor. Thank you, Tor. Brief tour of your new ship. Nah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I just had to. Sorry, I just had to. Roll came out. <laughs> it did. No, I just want to get to work, you know, I don't care. Vibrance is standing there in pure shock. So tempted and itching to draw a phaser and stun the captain. <laughs> the changing, get it. <laughs> the captain. Well, <laughs> no, I almost said it. No, no, it's not Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I almost said it. I almost. <laughs> okay, so that you know what you're dealing with, you are now on a ship that has 23 decks, whereas before the most you had to deal with was 15-ish. Now granted, some of those decks were the, um, 
the, uh, the, the flight ops on the, uh, the rear bar of the uh, Akira class Navis. But now you're dealing with a brand new ship and this thing has 23 decks in total. So, um, not to get too specific, senior officers quarters are on deck 3, obviously main bridge is on deck 1. As well as the captain's office in the situation room. Uh, let's see, captain's, captain's quarters, senior officers quarters and that stuff is on deck 3. The uh, holodeck and the main conference room are on deck 4. For the transporter room, transporter room one is actually on deck four as well, which uh, apparently Latude was none too happy about when he learned this. <laughs> Nevertheless, Any particular reason he's not happy. An even number. <laughs> a, it's an even number, and B, last time he was on like deck twelve or some such, and was quite a far away, if just quite a distance away from the bridge. Now he's a lot closer. It'll be Maybe. fine. I'm signing him, up, signing him up immediately for senior officer's briefings. <laughs> yes, yeah. Maybe he's of chi Chinese heritage. They don't like f deck four. The number four? Or yeah, level okay. four because it's... it's uh, Unlucky. Unlucky, uh, yeah. Oh no, homo. Oh no, oh no. Anyway, it sounds the same as the word for death. Yes. Uh, uh, so he's, like, he's trying to say something. I can feel it. <laughs> What is that word now? <laughs> he are some sure. Ooh, little cheaper joke, sir. Something like that. Phone on him? Phone on him, I think, yeah. Now, the good news is you have a computer core that stretches over three decks in size. <laughs> this is one hench computer core. It starts on deck eight and then goes up all the way to deck six. Uh, interestingly enough, on deck six is also where the science labs are, so... But deck seven is where Dr. Bertram will be going to do di medical diagnostics, decontam and quarantine, as well as surgery suites one to three are on deck seven, but the primary medical bay... Um, and the doctor's office are on deck eight. The entirety of Deck 9 is given over to your Bifrost Drive and the Dark Matter Taurus, as well as the storage and containment of Dark Matter. The good news is that... It's um, right in the middle of the ship if it goes... well, top well, third of the ship if it goes pop. It's where the <laughs> most structural... it's where pretty much where the most structural integrity is near. Yeah. However, the good news is you don't nine. have an entire entertainment deck on Deck 10. I don't deck. think we ever use that, do we? It's not, it's not 10 forward, it's 10 deck. <laughs> yeah. You've got an entertainment deck on Deck 10. You've got the ship's lounge, you've got the holodecks uh, 2 to 5, you've got the game room. And just in case, in case you need extra space, our cargo hold H is in there, too. Uh, the diplomatic deck is pretty much Deck 11 as well as the formal dining room. Regular crew quarters are on deck 12, as well as uh, sensors and navigation deflectors. So we've got more crew quarters, more crew quarters, phaser arrays and firing control and that kind of stuff on deck 15. The engineering deck starts on uh, deck 16, but is also on deck 17. So the cores are actually on decks, uh, deck 17, but they go as high as uh, deck 16 as well. Both cores 1 and 2. There's also a secondary bridge on deck 16, just in case it's needed. Transporter room 3 is also there. The fabrication deck is below that. The sh aft shuttle bay is deck 19. So most of Caval's... Um, uh, flight ops related uh, stuff will be going through deck 19. Yeah, sorry to tell you, Kifal, but um, flight ops is no longer going to be taking off from underneath the bridge consoles. Oh well. As long as I've still got a fighter craft. 
And well, this ship do. doesn't do fly through hangar bay. No, you've lost that, unfortunately. It is all via the rear, uh, the rear um, shuttle bay from now on. You don't do that, unfortunately. That's the, the main strength of the Akira. But you do have a sizable shuttle bay. Uh, I know how to make U-turns. Yes, there's that too. Uh, torpedo launches wait, and torpedo wait magazines a minute. on deck 20. <laughs> There's already a scratch down the uh, the side of the new shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think we're missing the port of Vintia. Which deck is dedicated to the storage of micro torpedoes? <laughs> Every deck. <laughs> 20. Fabrications. <laughs> that does come down to an interesting point. Uh, decks 21 and 22 are both where the matter antimatter reactant generators are. Matter is stored, or the deuterium rather, is stored on deck 21. The antimatter is stored on deck 22. There's extra space on deck 23, and that's where the main cargo transport is at. So that gives you a fair removes paint from his Shantor. So that's your brand new spanking ship with all the extra crew members who are now starting to file on board, trying to find out where they're going to. You come up to your brand new bridge, which uh, for the moment in time we have this lovely, lovely deck with so much space that you can actually probably have a football competition in there if you wanted to. But the main bridge, you come onto the bridge for the first time and it's great and it's wide and expansive. It's got all these different positions ready to fill it in because, you know, operations on a ship this big take a lot of people. Nevertheless, you've got your, uh, you, you all have your tour of the ship, you eventually start moving about, getting everybody into their proper positions. A couple of hours go by as you start powering up the ship systems, and of course, you're ready to perform the first official test flight, the Shakedown Cruise. And it's a case of, Caval, where do you fancy going? Second star to the lift. <laughs> Just to be different. And straight until evening. <laughs> and so you send a message down to Main Engineering to say ready for warp speed as you pull away from uh, from Narendra Station, ready to conduct your say, first warp flight. Warp speed. Warp speed straight out of the docking. Oh no! <laughs> you know what? Let's just activate the Bifrost <laughs> drive. Not even left try to boom. It's an alpha. Well, we sadly, your dark matter. Sorry, go on, yeah. Because we, uh, we need to know when and where we can activate it. <laughs> sadly, your supplies of dark matter have not been uh, brought in yet. They're coming through on Thursday. Tuesday. Well, it's Thursday this time. Ah, oh, it's always Tuesday. Um, nevertheless, we have, the, we have to go through the color system as well to get to that one. You know. So at this point, it's just testing to see how well this thing flies, and let's face it, it's the first thing that anybody wants to do. And so, second star to the left, just to be different. And with uh, with a very with a great deal of enthusiasm uh, be behind testing out your brand spanking new ship, daughter's having an existential crisis. Let's see what's out there. Engage. So, we find ourselves on board the ship, some days later, after you've had a day or two to start putting this ship through its paces. And we join the ship, the ship's crew, once again with Lieutenant Commander Thazanan, who has just gotten into uh, the... the uh, Turbo lift ready to go towards the conference room on deck. Did I just say it was deck three? It was a deck two. Do -do 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 -do. Let's find it. Move it deck. And deck, 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 deck. Conference room, the conference room. The conference room is on deck three, I believe. Let's. I can't find it. Let's go look on the list. 
do 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 so it's a case of uh, where am I going? Oh, because because normally the the conference room for the the, the Akira Navis would be on deck one, just behind the bridge. But no, the the um, now the, uh, the the senior officer's morning briefing on, uh, goes on on the, in the main conference room on deck four, and so Thazanan is uh, travelling uh, in the uh, the turbo lift. But then he hears, hold the lift, and it's Vibers this time. Vibers who has numerous data pads he's trying to get through, whilst also having a balancing a Ractagino on himself as he, on himself, on the pads, I should say. He's balancing it on his head, let's say. <laughs> as Vibers um, files in, trying to get a, a drink of his morning Ractagino, whilst also trying to wade through these, um, these data pads. I didn't even know we had a secondary... Is that a food processor or is that a science experiment? Oh, I need more coffee. <laughs> Let me help you with that Rector Gino. <laughs> <laughs> just takes his coffee. <laughs> That's an act of war right there, isn't it? <laughs> Look, it's a war crime. <laughs> Trill and Andoria are now at war. Anyway. <laughs> So, yes, Vib Vibers as the turbo lift is proceeding down to deck four. Is it down to deck four? Yes. It's to be on it is two. now. <laughs> it's a short trip, but nevertheless, uh, Thazanan is there with <laughs> reports. As, uh, as Vibers is there, just looking at all these things, going, Dear God, who's the who is this person? I've never, never met them before. How am I meant to know how they perform? So, the turbo lift lands on deck four, you get out, and as soon as Vibers steps out of the turbo lift, there is a swarm of officers who come around him with more reports to sign off on, more things that they are indeed reporting. Right, you, you're staying here. Punk, that's a big pile of reports. Hold them. <laughs> Give him and... them. Follow me. So Thazanan's there just with a kind of a sly smile on his face, going, ha, ha. he's got stuff he has to do. And then, with a with a sinking feeling, a couple as as he exits the uh, the turbo lift, a couple of officers start to move towards him. In more than just two, more like five, start to descend on um, on Thazanan as they go cheap. We have we have flight ops. Uh, we have flight ops data for you. And suddenly, Thazanan is um, being swarmed with reports on shuttle flight readiness. New pilot training uh, tests need to be signed off on. Engineering reports on helm operations are coming in. And of course, the Bifrost Drive's last test flight data needs to be signed off on before it can be used again. So, Vibers and Thazanan are now both <laughs> being arried as they're proceeding towards the conference room. They finally reach it, the doors open, they find the place empty. And they manage to eventually barge their way through this crowd of junior officers who are all trying to get reports given to them or have uh, their senior officers sign off on reports. And you pretty much physically shut the doors on these people and breathe a sigh of relief as there's finally quiet. As you turn around on the Approved empty conference for room. Signature. <laughs> stamp, 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 stamp. <laughs> As you as you turn around to find the conference room empty, you suddenly see a number of heads pop up from behind chairs. <laughs> as Ori and maybe Bertram and, and and several other senior officers kind of poke their heads up, going, "Is it safe?" <laughs> and everyone can sit down and just go, "Oh, thank God, you got through the crowd as well." But then you notice somebody's missing. It's a case of, "Wait a minute, where the hell's Nova?" At which point, there's a clattering sound coming from a nearby um, access panel. It falls away, and Nova comes, squirms out of it. Looks like she's got you know dirt and dust on her, and she goes, "Yes, I am officially the hide and seek winner. You guys aren't even trying anymore." So, what are we all doing here again? Meanwhile. Down in engineering. So let's go to lower engineering. Uh -oh. 
as we, even though we've only got one core here, of course we have two cores going on in this place. What is lower engineering A? This is lower engineering, where the um, the captain exits the turbo lift and finds that not only does it have the familiar double, well, the now familiar double thrum of a warp engine, the place is well, pretty much an absolute cacophony. If I can find a cacophony, that'll work. And there's, you know, there's, there's, there's not exactly chaos, but there's people running about all over the place. And with um, his back to the captain, Chief Engineer Bravo is there basically yelling across the room. Um, Keth! As the Chief, as uh, Engineer Keth kind of pokes his head out from around uh, a console. As, uh, Bravo is there yelling over the din. Keth! Tell your officer Kavek to stop harassing my officers. He doesn't need to fight for his place in the crew. His place is secure. Tell him he doesn't need to throw his weight around. His job is secure. He doesn't need to fight other people for it. Tell him to cool the F out. Engineer Keth just goes, Bleh, and wanders off to find the uh, the, uh, the <laughs> officer he was told about. Poor Keth. Uh, poor Keth. Uh, poor Keth. <laughs> A cool has beaten the Klingon out of him. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, Bravo then goes over to Stevens and goes, Stevens, Stevens. You need to monitor the intermix ratio on both the cores, okay? We have two cores now. We have to make sure they're both level. Stevens, of course, is like, oh, damn it, of course. Sorry, Chief. It's fine. It's fine. You need to get somebody else to help you if you are having trouble with doing this all on your own. You're a semi-senior officer now, and we've got you recruits in. You are allowed to appoint somebody to help you. Okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and she wanders off, at which point with his with his hands on his hips and he just kind of sags in place for a minute. Captain! Thank you for coming. And he eventually turns around and wanders off to him. As you can see, it's a bit chaotic in here at the moment. I don't mind telling you. This Carry on, Commander. It will get better. Yes. Well, this... We have some slight issues, uh, if you don't mind me going over them. Mostly, well, the Klingons, for one, are used to an entirely different social strata. <laughs> it's been interesting trying to get to get them to cool out. Apparently they're very much used to trying to fight to maintain their position in the ship. As such, it's been a bit tense between the Klingon engineers and our own engineers for a little bit since our own engineers are feeling a bit harassed. Mostly because it's the way the Klingon engineers are used to operating. I have to say, though, this would probably be going a hell of a lot worse for me if it wasn't for Keth. Keth has been greatly accommodating and has been extraordinarily useful. But every time I try and give him a compliment, he just kind of brushes it away and seems to snort in my general direction. The general feeling I'm getting off of him is that this isn't the Klingon way of doing things. So, he's actually used to a bit of abuse. In fact, he, from what I get of his mind when I'm near him, he actually kind of misses it. It's interesting. When we last saw the dynamic between Captain Akul and Engineer Keth, he got the impression that Keth was this kind of embattled, beleaguered creature that was just being browbeaten into oblivion. Well, apparently, 
Keth wouldn't have it any other way. In fact, he respects Captain de Cool rather a lot. Is fiercely loyal to him, in fact. And I get the general impression that as according to how Keth feels about it, he thinks Captain Akul respects him as well. But they still talk to each other like they each think that the other ones are worthless. As such, it's getting to be a bit of a slight sticking issue between our two different crews at the moment, but we're managing as best we can. Would you like me to have a word with uh, Commander Keth? Yes and no. What I think needs to happen is that... With your permission, Captain, I need to do something that Commander Vibers did for me when he was Chief Engineer. I need to appoint a second. So You're the commanding officer down here. You uh, make the decisions for this department. Thank you, Captain, but it would be nice to get an uh, official note on the log saying that you approve of it. But You're best. asking if I approve of Commander Kef as your second? Yes, Captain. Of course. I've Thank seen you, Commander Captain. Kef in battle. I would trust him with my life as much as I would trust any of the other officers in here. That's good to know. And he has an inordinate amount of respect for you as well, Captain. Just don't tell him I told him that. He gets rather embarrassed about when I let slip how I know how he feels and thinks. He then tries to think about something else other than his private thoughts, which he's trying to keep private, and then, of course, by thinking about them, he brings them to the fore, and he has some... Well, I'm not going to go into it just for his own privacy's sake, but let's just say relations between the two of us at the moment are a bit awkward. I think this might go a step towards alleviating some of that and trying to establish some good camaraderie between both our crews, too. That brings me on to the Klingon cloaking device. Um, the interaction at the moment between our systems and this... things... operation are still proving to be a bit of a headache. The power draw on this thing is... big, to say the least. This cloaking device was apparently pulled off of a Navar? They thought a bigger cloaking device needed to come off of a bigger ship to accommodate our bigger ship, so they pulled it off of one of the biggest ships they have. As such, the power draw in this thing is ridiculous, so we're gonna need some time to do another test on this thing, because otherwise we're gonna have a system shutdown before you know it. That brings me on to the deuterium issue. <laughs> This thing, and he gestures at the two cores, this thing chews through deuterium and anti-deuterium like you wouldn't believe when we go at high warp. So we're going to need to look at our deuterium and anti-deuterium storage quite thoroughly, and that comes with a slight issue in regards to quantum torpedo storage. Because we can't fabricate quantum torpedoes like we do photon torpedoes, we need to store all the parts necessary for quantum torpedoes, and that's starting to butt up against the sheer amount of projected deuterium and anti-deuterium we're going to need to stockpile in order to make sure that we don't suffer a shortage in an emergency, as per regulation. Which means we're going to need to figure out places to start storing this stuff. Need your permission to start getting creative, Captain? <laughs> Andrew is just like, you're taking up my valuable torpedo story <laughs> with your anti deuterium. Andrew's store is in the port in the cell. Yeah, we want to store it in the cell. The port in the cell is empty, isn't it, Commander? <laughs> just store it there. I'm sure there'd be no downside to storing deuterium and anti-deuterium in the same area as the nacelles electro <laughs> the nacelle coils. Wait, you are kidding, right? I sometimes get conflicting messages when you're being sarcastic and not. Make the necessary changes. We will. I'm pretty sure that we can squeeze some space out of some of the uh, crew quarters. I'm sure they'll... storage locations. 
I'm sure they'll um, cope. Be thrilled, Captain. Have you They're... seen the captain's? Uh, have you seen my quarters? It's like half a deck. <laughs> it's like there's plenty of room. I have a desk and a bed, and that's all I need. <laughs> Well, Captain, if if you don't mind, then maybe we can look for some. Start with the senior crew. I'm sure we can shave off five foot, five feet off of every senior crew's rooms. I'll look into that, Captain. Thank you. Uh, diplomatic rooms as well. We don't need them. I was the going to ask deck. about that, Captain. The, the bar is the entirety of deck ten. There's no need for a bar that big. <laughs> The Mr. Manoko's only got two arms, it's like he can't reach moment. What about the oons, 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 oons? <laughs> the whole deck is a natural sound. <laughs> well, now we're on the subject of reinforcing a deck. Um, <laughs> I do have to bring up the slight note with the last time we actually trialed out the Bifrost Drive. And uh, we might need to reinforce the decks above and below deck nine, since the last time we tested the Bifrost drive, the, the gravitational anomaly started leaking off of deck nine and insinuating themselves into decks eight and ten. So, with your permission, Captain, I need uh, crews to start reinforcing the the dampening around deck nine. What's on deck eight? Out of interest. Again. What's on deck eight out of interest? Good question. Deck eight. Main computer computer core, core. Medical bay. The 65 bed recovery area. The <laughs> clinic. <laughs> the doctor's <laughs> office. <laughs> the counselor's suite. Life science labs. The arboretum and the mycelial spore bay. And life pods. Right, so it's, nothing it's crucial. Fine. It's <laughs> fine. Because if gravity, if the gravity goes a bit weird on deck eight, then it's right. The patients are, like their blood's going to naturally pool in their body. <laughs> A deck ten, it just adds to the ambience of being sat in a full-size deck bar. <laughs> I think the captain's a little bit strange. Do what you need to do, Commander. Thank you, sir. I'll be sending these reports and these official request logs up to your office within the next two hours, if that's possible. Oh, I think Commander Vibers needs to sign up for that. <laughs> Um, are you sure? Because the last time I tried sending engineering officers to sign off on stuff to Cap Commander Vibers, he ran away. And we didn't find him until three hours later. You and only you can send reports to me. Everything else has to go through. And the Vibers, as he is the executive officer. Very well, Captain. I will, um, I'll, I'll maybe get Edwards to do it. Hmm? He looks a bit not occupied enough. Thank you, Captain. Edwards! Got jobs for you! But first, yeah, stabilize the power yeah. systems! Sorry, Edwards is not here. Please leave your message at the sound of the beep. Beep. No, no, he's not gonna say that. So, um, yes. The ruckus continues, even though um, engineering is like two decks worth of engineering now. It's pretty loud, <laughs> with all the people shouting over each other. But. <laughs> At the moment, things are working not exactly like a well-oiled machine, but, you know, Starfleet efficiency is still there. You've got quite a few new faces that you haven't gotten used to yet. And, of course, there's the Klingon officers who are busying themselves with trying to figure out Starfleet efficiency and, uh, and teamwork. But, nevertheless... Yeah, the as Andrews does leave engineering, she will shout at Kef to say that do better. This is a disgrace from a Klingon, to, uh, from a Klingon crew. I'm very sorry, Captain. I will do better. You! He points to one of the nearest at Klingon engineers. You have disgraced us! Look! Right in front of the Captain! Well, don't just stand there gawping at me. At least pretend you're doing your job! Sorry, Captain. 
Ah, uh, yeah, and it ensues in that general, general manner. Um, yeah, Dr. Bertram, your, your med bay is now huge. I mean, um, essentially we are using the same, uh, maps that we've used previously, but, um, now you have multiple medical suites, you know, med bays available for, um, patient recovery and, and, and so it's, as well as the, the two bays either side of your primary office, you've got multiples elsewhere. Two decks worth of uh, sick bay, essentially. So Doc Bertram uh, alternates between decks eight and seven, I do believe. Seven and eight. Yeah. I imagine uh, Bertram would spend some time, first of all, with his medical team, sort of making sure that everything's up to code and is working, and then setting things up so that Basically, the way he kind of envisions it working most efficiently is a kind of two-tier two by situation system. In a non-emergency situation, we, which he defines as basically an ongoing situation where they're being flooded by injuries in, say, a battle, uh, he wants sort of like certain areas to be designated as some specialist areas, so one for surgery, one for disease and quarantine, um, one for sort of like um, environmental stuff and so on, but with the ability, like in an emergency situation, to switch into what you probably call triage mode to basically maximize the amount of people they can see at one time. That makes sense, yeah. <laughs> Filtration, that's great. Yeah. All right, then. So, yes, there's been a lot for everybody to deal with. One of the more interesting jobs has been Lieutenant Nova's. Usually distributing power with the additional reactors on the previous Navis was a case of somebody wants power and it can go from there, somebody wants power it can go from there, somebody wants power, well this is easy. You know, they've all got to come through Nova and Nova just allocates power as it's available and necessary. My my, this beast is a hungry one. <laughs> So, two warp cores generates a lot of power, but two warp cores also requires a good deal of power too. And what with the fact that there are now other integrated systems into this, there's, you know, the entirety of Deck 9 is the, is the uh, Bifrost Drive's deck. And you've got a main computer that occupies three decks now. Um, power distribution is a lot busier than it's ever been for Nova as Chief Operations Officer. People's requests are coming in thick and fast always, and it's a case of um, allocating power as soon as it's available. Um, and that's pretty much immediately. Uh, every time... Um, I'm not explaining this very well, actually. Let me re rewind that. <laughs> Essentially, in game terms, we're going to alter how things work a little bitty bit. This will only come up during um, combat, but to represent how thirsty this beast is as far as power goes, every system on the ship will require power in order to work, so the operations officer will have to allocate that power. So at any given time, communications, computers, engines, sensors, structure and weapons all require power, which obviously means a lot of, you know, at least a point of power has to go to every department, every system, rather I should say, um, in order to let them work. But of course, certain actions like um, combat, uh, combat helm maneuvers, or indeed firing the main phases, um, stuff that require power draws, like putting power back into shields and stuff like that, will draw power from those, from those systems. And if the operations officer doesn't allocate enough power to those individual systems, they will run out and be unable to support the, uh, the, the attempt to do something with that system. So it becomes a kind of a fine balancing act of maybe transferring power out of a non-essential system like, let's say, communications, in order to fill the gap that's, uh, that weapons suddenly needs because it's uh, run out of juice. So, Nova's job has just become a little bit more like a juggling act than it was before. 
So a lot of power is generated by these dual uh, dual cores, but every department needs power and is kind of hungry for it. So Nova's job is very much a balancing act now, of, or kind of a, a, a fine art, almost, of trying to balance what they need with what they might need with how much you've got available to distribute. So, yes. And of course, the unlimited power uh, memes start coming out. So, with that all in mind, the th the main thrust is that everybody's getting used to their new jobs. Obviously, where they're placed as well on the bridge and otherwise within the ship. Um, the Guru is obviously a great deal more populous, so those of you who are all um, in charge of departments have obviously got new members of those departments, all of which will need training and uh, will need to orientate themselves to how things work here on the Navis, the new Navis. But, so far, so good. Let's take away the engineering ambience, keep ourselves on the bridge ambience as we come to word has come through to you now that um, an area of the Shackleton expanse would uh, command would like you to survey it as comes off of trying to maintain the uh, the effort of finding Ashtamalia and the trapped Tilikal a way out of their current predicament. So, what with having had your shakedown crews of your new ship, you're now actively being put into the field in order to make sure this thing works, and to do what it's supposed to do, which is go out and respond to whatever's needed of it. So, as a result, Admiral Hebert has tasked... Go on, sorry, I just talked over you there. Sorry, before we go out on the shakedown crews, can we invite the two captains uh, on board for the state, you know, for like a dinner? Which two captains would those be? Blackford and... Oh, and Corbett. What's his name? Yeah, Captain Corbett. Uh, you can invite them, absolutely certainly, yes. Hmm. Now, Blackford refuses the invitation. But Corbett... Can I request that Admiral Hebert makes it mandatory attendance? <laughs> you can try. But um, uh, one of my influence points with her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as a result, she, she will try. <laughs> but Blackford refuses to uh, to attend. He's elsewhere. He's even off station. He's trying so much to be elsewhere. But uh, Corbett does receive the invitation and makes the effort of bringing the venture back into uh, Narendra Station's space in order that he can attend this. Uh, basically, this christening of of the new Navis. So, yeah. Might ring up my old mate JP as well and be like, JP, <laughs> come see ship. Um, Better than yours. Yours isn't, mine isn't in bits. <laughs> <laughs> Are you seriously going to we'll show up Captain Picard? We'll send a message to... Go on, sorry. A cool as well. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A cool will be yeah. around, actually, because, well, basically, there's... Before your new ship arrived, Akuls was the only uh, combat-capable ship that was able to guard uh, Narendra Station. That's a good point, actually. Word comes down to all of you, the senior staff, that apparently due to the security concerns going on with Narendra Station now, a second Klingon ship is being posted to, um, to the Expanse in order to help with the shortfall. However, what you do notice from Captain Akul and your Klingon crew is as soon as word reaches of who is on their way, um, it's not immediately apparent to you guys, but uh, you hear the name of the ship, the IKS, the Mochbinal, which means nothing to most of you, but um, to the ones who actually are aware of the kind of uh, culture behind ships like this, the Mochbinal is actually a, a, a Katanga class. So a rather old ship, <clears throat> and it doesn't look like it's been refit that much when you do see it. But um, 
Vibers and Keth, and those with a bit more working Klingon knowledge, will know that the Mochbinal is one of those uh, Klingon ships that are populated mostly with criminals who are being basically forced to work off their, pardon me, their, their jail term by serving on an Empire ship. So it's a prison workshop. Essentially, yes. So the, the Klingons are apparently drafting in uh, criminals who've been caught and been thrown into being indentured officers. The Klingons, with a long and storied history of slavery and in their empire, don't think anything of this. This is criminals working off their debt to the empire. Yeah. Not so. that unusual. The unusual bit for them is the fact they're in the officer positions as well as the crew. So, um, yes, oh, some yeah. Klingons are looking at this as a bit of a, oh, now we have scum joining us. So it remains to be seen what effect the crew of the Moch, or the presence alone of the Moch Benal has. But, um, it's extra security in its own way, but, um... <laughs> Klingons and those with Klingon knowledge don't seem all that reassured by the Mochbinal's presence. Based off that information, I'm going to go I'm going to talk to the station bar and see if there's any blood wine they want to they want to rescue and keep off the premises for the time being. That's a good point actually. Um anybody who goes to visit Mr. Monoko on his uh, on his entire deck <laughs> the entertainment deck, uh, will find that he has gone to great lengths to um, stock Klingon blood wine. But he does complain that that's all the buggers seem to drink. <laughs> they seem to be forgetting that Klingons, Klingons have got a range of different uh, drinks and ales that they have produced over time, and uh, he's familiar with a good many of them, as a good barman should be. But naturally, these guys are just being very, very uh, stereotypical Klingons and are just asking for blood wine all the time, so he's got barrels of the stuff. Just to keep the new clientele happy. Yes. Nope, okay. It sounded like somebody was taking a breath in, ready to, uh, ready to make a point. Okay, so we find ourselves put out into the Shackleton Expanse with interest in investigating an area of space. So, going on what I was saying before, um, just to be clear though, to address the whole um, the, the whole dinner with the captains, it goes as well as you expect. You know, uh, Corbett is very happy to um, have been invited. It's a nice ship. It reminds him of a, of a, of a galaxy class in size, but of course um, looks very different in the interior. So he reckons you should have some good use out of this. But he, <laughs> when he hears some of the tales of like you know, it's it's a nightmare at the moment with crew reviews and having to, you know, the sheer amount of crew that you now have to manage is is, is quite a hefty thing. And he said, "Oh yes, I remember those days." Nevertheless. The rest of that evening goes as, as well as you as you expect because you know Blackfist's not there. So the mission you are undertaking is to do with trying to um, trying to keep up your promise that you made to the Tilikal when you uh, when you met them, saying that you're going to try and find a way of maybe helping them get out of their current predicament, or at the very least investigate their current predicament. So, there is an area of space in the Shackleton Expanse, the Fran Lambda system, which has uh, got, is, is dense in pulsars, has swirls of electromagnetic radiation and powerful gravimetric disturbances, which uh, could be useful in your studies. So that is where the ship is currently headed to. Hmm and is currently investigating. So, whilst you're there, on a standard science mission, somebody who wants to use sensors 
which can be alright as per usual, but with Mike not being here, it's up for whoever wants to try it, basically. It's going to be anybody who uh, wants to do any kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like uh, astrological phenomena, stellar phenomena, that kind of thing. Anybody with those kind of areas of expertise would be useful in having a Goosey's Gander at. Uh, would that be from the Bravos then, potentially? Um, well, let's have a look. Um, stellar Cartography Bravo has got astrophysics as an assist. I mean, you've got Lieutenant Alex Monod, who has got astrological phenomena and sensor operation as focus. Um, cursed. Cursed has got sensor use as well. Turin has got astrophysics. Ori himself does not get anything specific to those. So you've got you've got at least how many did I mention there? One, two. You've got at least three people there with some expertise that can be used if you want to use it. Fizal also has got stellar phenomena and sensors. As does Ensign Eric. So, your choice, basically. Who do you think should uh, should be used? I mean, whoever, really. Feel free to check over them. If you need to. But, um, this could be a good opportunity to also generate some momentum. So... So, Bravo lead, the other two support. So these three up at the top by here, yeah? Yep. Okay, well, uh, Alex, since you volunteered that, let's have you as Bravo of Stellar Cartography. Uh, Sean, can I get you to be Fizal and Webby, be Eric? Jenny? I think that's everybody who hasn't rolled much yet. Or if at all, and nobody's rolled really much at all. So we are looking at a reason and science task assisted by sensors and science. Who can be the ship? Who wants to be the ship? Gareth, you're usually the ship. You can be the ship. I'll have to be the ship. You know where to find it? Usual place, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Oh. Navis A. Sure, um, thank you very much for Fizal. Um Webby, are you around? Webby's not around. How about... Yeah. Uh, oh, you are around. Can you be Ensign Jenny Eric, please? Reason and Science? Jenny Sen Eric and Science. Sensors yes, and Science for the ship? Sensors and Science for the ship, please. Stellar Phenomena as a foci. Uh, stellar Phenomena as a focus. Yes. Okay. Focus Ooh. on that. Wow. Right, so that's lots of successes there. So, uh, Inlus Bravo, head of stellar cartography, gives us two. And Ensign Jenny Eric gives us two for four. So that's a whopping great big four momentum you've just generated there. Ah. Now, since I am new to this ship, there's nothing new on the Navis A that generates any extra momentum or stuff like that from sensors, is there? No. Ablative armor, quantum torpedoes, secondary reactors, advanced shields, improved hull integrity, propulsion system cloaking device. Mostly very martial combative stuff. Cool. Sensors are reasonably good on this, and your science isn't huge, but it's not bad, so yeah. Pretty much what you expect from a general response vessel. Cool. So, um, many of the pulsars within scanning range appear to be new, formed within decades of each other. Which anybody in uh, stellar cartography or st uh, with an interest in stellar phenomena of any kind will tell you that this is a rather unlikely natural event. Uh, with that many extra successes over what you needed as well, the information you also get is that Gravimetric disturbances in this region of the expanse have also increased in intensity over the last decade or more. 
and you're also picking up trace evidence of coherent tetrionic filaments. Something is going on in this area of space beyond traditional science. <clears throat> it looks like we might be in the right place, Captain. As you're busy studying the data, a uh, computer alert comes from the comm station here over where Lieutenant Keshen is at. We find his voice mark. Communications are picking up an audio-only distress signal. Appears to be coming from an unidentified vessel a short distance away. I'm afraid at the moment, even though the signal is clear, the language is currently indecipherable. Ed was pretty... Uh, is pretty up with this. So, uh, do 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 do. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to give it a go? Uh, Ed was asking if you could send him a sample. Hmm. Just play it for him, see what, and he'll uh, give it a go. Also, uh, Keshen could lend a hand. So, uh, Jan, if you fancy being, who hasn't rolled yet? Davis, have you rolled yet? Nope. Are we allowing Davis to roll yet? Yeah. <laughs> new ship, new rules. <laughs> okay, in that case... Part of uh, the ship, part of the crew. Davis, if you could be Keshin then for a minute. Uh, we're going with reason and science with xenolinguistics for uh, Keshin, and we're going similar for Edwards. Let's see if we can work it out. One dice for Cashin. Nice. One success. Two dice with focus from Edwards, if we could, please, Alex. Very good. Three successes overall. Definitely over and above what you needed. You now have a full pool. So... <clears throat> Helping with uh, both of them are now helping the universal translator. The uh, the voice coming over the audio only com definitely has a higher pitch and therefore sounds female. And uh, you start trying to you, you basically let them talk for as long as possible to get more as as much of the language as you possibly can. You start uh, both identifying the structure, the syntax. It seems to follow um, the logical uh, um, structure that most uh, higher languages do. And so, after a few moments of effort, you uh, put in the formulas needed for the Universal Translator to begin, which then beeps a confirmation. And as you put through your translation matrix, uh, you put the transmission over so everybody can hear. Hello. Can anyone hear us? I am Commander Mounty of the Akaro Explorer Starward. Is there anybody there? Please respond if you can hear us. respond. More importantly, who's going to respond? Nah. I see, it's one of those <laughs> evenings, is know? it? 
what do we know of the uh, Atari and Karu? The name what Akaru said, so has, does not appear in any of your databases. Might be a first contact situation, Captain. It's an emergency response situation, at least, Captain. It is. Open, com uh, open communications, uh, Keshen. Listen. This is Captain Andrews of the USS Navis. Report, uh, with oh. Did Webby just break up and Webby stop for up. everybody else? Yep. Matt, uh, are the Navis's um, communication fins coming on Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's alright, my headset just disconnected part way through. Yes. Uh, yes, yes Try we again. will open communications and we will appoint to say that we are from the USS Navis and that we are moving to assist. You get a response through. Wait, uh, I can understand you. Incredible. Um. Thank you, thank you for your assistance. An intense graviton wave has impacted my vessel. Our propulsion systems and primary shielding are inoperable. Most of my technical crew members died in the initial impact. We are adrift and require immediate assistance. May the Eriax guide you to us. So. Anybody who wants to try can give me a reason and science check with anything to do with sensors or navigation or anything like that to try and pinpoint the ship's location. This will be a reason and science check with a difficulty of one assisted by the ship's sensors and science. So whoever fancies giving me a whistle in that regard. All hands, we've received a distress signal, prepare for rescue operations. So. Yep, after Vipers right. makes that note, you get a return note from um, Engineering saying that they are now assembling uh, a work team uh, to do so. Response team, I should say. I'll assist in the role, but my um, science isn't that great. But I do have extra navigation. You do. So, this is going to be reason and science. So, anybody with a reasonably good sensors and science sensors and science that's the ship you're talking about Matt <laughs> reasonably good reason and science well or I definitely uh, fits the bill so <laughs> Claude can do this are we seriously letting Claude do this why not sure if Claude can not had any if Claude can give me reason and science, then? I mean, he's got no foci to do it with. Do you want him to lead or do you want him to assist? Say assist. Assist, okay. Why don't we have... Um, Sean, could you be Ori for me, please? And give me, a, our chief science officer, a, a role. Or do you want Nova to do it? Uh, no, Ori could do it. Okay. It's just that I see Ori's stats are geared in that direction, so maybe we'll have him lead. Okay, yeah, one success from Thazanan using navigational sensors. Gareth, uh, you want to be the, uh, the ship as usual. Sorry, Sean, what was that? Reason and science. Yes, please. Ori doesn't it's really it's have a skin. focus, so it'll have to be on pure talent. And yes, for the ship, it'll be sensors and science again, please. Alright, once again, nothing from the ship, but Ori does pull it in with a success. So, I mean, Webby, if you want to do Clort, since he's your favourite. Was it insight and science? Was that? It was reason and science. Uh, reason and science. Reason and science. Uh, Clort can do science. Hand to hand combat as a no. point guy. <laughs> that's, that's part of science, right? Yeah, it's no. science. <laughs> right, it is I'm a science all its own. I and confirm. I will use I am Claude. <laughs> if you want to use his determination, then by all means. <laughs> one success from Claude, so Claude does help. So, using targeting sensors. So ah, one, Claude's secondary two, button has a purpose. Three. Three successes overall. You are able to pinpoint the ship very, very well. 
The damaged vessel appears to be adrift deep within a well of gravimetric eddies and increasing electromagnetic radiation. So let me take you ever so briefly to our map as you enter in system. Now, those who would like to uh, back zoom out a little bit on this map will see that there is a trait for this area of space, dangerous spatial phenomena, so everything will be that much more difficult to do when it comes to uh, mostly helm engines. Uh, do 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 do. Not that that makes any difference to uh, to Caval's ability to pilot this ship, but that's where we're going next. So in order to successfully get yourselves to the stricken ship, which I have just revealed, and it's down here. In order to get there, you're going to have to navigate a course through gravimetric eddies. So this is going to be either a control or a daring and con task with a difficulty of three. Actually, that lowers down to difficulty two because of Thazanan's uh, piloting abilities. But it will be assisted by the ship the ship's engines and con, but the uh, the complication range increases by three as well. Ramming speed. So anybody that wants to give... Two, sorry, three. Jan, I talked over you there. What was that? Sorry, is it by three or two, three? It goes up by three. So it goes up two, three, actually. Let's not be too sick here. That's going to be ridiculous. It goes up two, three. So when you have to enter what the complication range is, it could, it, you put in three. Blah, 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 blah. So you can either choose to do daring or you can do control and con. Uh, somebody who hasn't rolled all that much at the moment. I mean, Sean, you've already rolled. Gareth, you've already rolled as the ship. Yan, you're going to roll now. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Davis, you may as well be the ship for this. I'm gonna grab a point of momentum just to play it safe. Cool. And anybody who wants to try and assist with the uh, the the con navigation is probably welcome to as well. Not that I doubt that um, yeah, the Thassanan's gonna pull this off. So let's get one from the ship. Uh, that's all of Thazanan's rolls. Whoa! One from the ship as well. Nobody else wanted to help, and nobody needed to by the looks of it, because you definitely get a lot. So, the ship is guided expertly through the, uh, through the, uh, the gravimetric eddies. Mazanan having a very natural ability, it seems, to be able to find the right, the the, the, the right eddies in the in the various shifts, finding the lee uh, in, the, in the various currents and whatnot, and eventually fight to the other ship. Yes, yeah. Sorry, I talked over you again. Uh, oh no, sorry. I was just thinking with the with the extra momentum, can we create an um, uh, Advantage thing we've mapped the eddies. Ooh. I'll say yes, absolutely. Cool beans. There you go, right there. Makes sense. So, yes, Caval not only piloted the ship very well through these gravimetric eddies, but also made sure to note where those uh, easier, less stressful points. Um, through through the eddies were, so you've got a, uh, a fully mapped out area to go through the next time you do. So, you get a message from the uh, the Akaru ship, the Starwood. Captain, or commander I should say, Mauti, 
It says that they, that, uh, they have you on their sensor scans. They await your arrival. So, let's go back to the bridge. And so, who are you going to send over? Uh, well. Researching species at Edwards would request permission to join. That makes sense. Engineer and a linguist. Always good. And obviously a new culture. Fascinating stuff. Want me to go over in case I needed the medical assistance. Good point. Who else do you want to send? Nova. Nova? I mean, Nova's I'd always up for Nova. new stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Meeting new people and seeing their technology and how they act and all that kind of stuff. That makes sense. Well, I think as my away team leader, off you go, Mimers. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about, about to say, Captain, did you want to go on the first contact mission? Oh, or... uh, it's first contact, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, on top of that. I have the paperwork I can give you. Uh, I like how in like every no you know sort of Star Trek series, it's always the first time saying I'll go, and the captain go, I want to go. You're too important. On this one, it's both. It's both going. Oh, oh, I don't want to, but you yeah. have to, captain. Vibers leaps and into the captain's the chair. chair. <laughs> uh, Kamal, you have the card. <laughs> 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 You're coming with me, boy. <laughs> no, uh, so the captain's going. Is Vipers going with, or is Vipers uh, having the con? No, I'd say uh, if we're doing it that way, we, we keep. Yeah, you probably want a. You want a security person. Yeah, and some more engineers probably to try and get their ship back. Up yep. So who do you want from security? Um. <laughs> bring the teak, just to be different. Bring the teak, just to yeah. be different. Nice. Yeah. The, ca the captain hasn't yet sort of like. <laughs> <laughs> <up running from. laughs> Oop, Webby's breaking up again. And the headset's gone again. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you, you did it too soon. Dude, yeah, yeah, you're too thing. early. <laughs> <laughs> But the captain's bum print hasn't sort of like embedded into the chair yet, so it's still got that new. It's only going to take a short amount of time. Uh, fibers to engineering. Uh, we're going to need a uh, small engineering team to go with the captain's away mission. Uh, could you assign someone you trust to lead it, please? <laughs> There's a pause as Bravo thinks. You can send Kev. I was going to say, Kev! <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have access to Keth? That's a good question. Have I copied him over? No. I might not have. Let me, no. let me move him over from uh, the Mapui crew. There he is. I'll create a special copy of him. That is True. in <laughs> your supporting <laughs> character list. True Keth. Changed the Keth. <laughs> Uh, this one needs to have his actor data linked. There we go. So I'll take that Keth away and replace it with the one you should have access to, but I'm going to make absolutely certain. No, it didn't. Take my Keth away. So there we go. Keth is now linked. It is linked to that one, which is nice. Uh, he has got. <laughs> his focus is a hand to hand and resilience burst into a battle. We may have to tailor his um, talents a little bit and stuff, but that comes Nah. Out. Nah, he fits. We are Klingon! Hit it with hammer, make it better. Exactly. Fix it. Fix it now. Right, so that's the Today is a good day to die. Good <laughs> day is a good day to die. It's a, <laughs> it's a, a diplomatic mission! <laughs> like, like, just 
Today's good day to die. We're on a mapping mission. All I asked <laughs> you was to look at these moss samples. <laughs> I know what moss does to the humans. <laughs> okay, so we've got Do an engineer with... Do the Klingons have to say that every time they make something a different colour? <laughs> Today is a good day to die. You know what? No, no it isn't. Have you looked at the calendar? <laughs> I think <Tuesday>. not. <laughs> Tuesday. Your death isn't coming till Tuesday, so sit down and be quiet. Okay, so we've got Engineer Kath to be from Engineering. We've got Ensign Teak for Security. We've got Nova because Engineering and Curiosity. Andrews because of First Contact and Diplomacy. Edwards because of Engineering and also New Culture stuff. And Bertram in case of uh, medical related issues. So, is that everybody you want to take? Take one more, so we've all got one person when Mike's back as well. Up to you guys. It can't yeah. hurt to take an Aura. I can't was going to say Aura is usually up for most things, as we <laughs> rightly know. Yeah, let's take an Aura in. Okay. I may have just tried to move him at the same time as you, so let me uh, may have created a duplicate <laughs> there by accident. Uh, how is the... I assume we're in the middle of a gravimetric storm, so I wouldn't recommend well, transporting over. thanks to Thazan and mapping those currents, you will now have an easier time. So it's up to you still. If you think there's a uh, risk involved, then shuttles might be more necessary, but... You might be safer with the transporter than the shuttles. I don't know how well I. Good point. Transports cover with that. How big is this ship? And how damaged does it look? It's not small by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but it's you know it's still not as big as your ship. But let, let's use an American measurement system. So how many bald eagles is it? <laughs> <laughs> If we go with ship scale, their ship is a scale 3 and yours is a scale 6, so it's almost literally right. half your size. Does anything look like it would fit where our external docking ports are? Yes. Do we do this old fashioned and literally park alongside? You could alongside. pull alongside and... Yeah. Them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, entirely probable. If that's what you want to do. Oh, go on, Caval, see if you can not put a scratch on it. If you really okay. need to test how well Caval. you can pull up alongside. Parking manoeuvres. <laughs> Alright, what, what colour on the Royka Biv scale do we need to go to? Uh, <laughs> Indigo alert. I don't we have that, next but... To, <laughs> we are parking next to another ship. <laughs> so, did, Captain, did you want the scratch on the Nevis or the other ship? <laughs> 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 uh, Neither, Commander. So I should get the scratch on the shuttle in the shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the scratch can go on your command console <laughs> in a place that's visible from the captain's chair. The scratch should go on Blackford's ship. That'll teach yeah. him not to turn <laughs> up to dinner. Yeah, he didn't turn up to dinner. Therefore, I want to scratch on the Bellerophon. <laughs> It's going to be tricky, Fire. but I'll try. <laughs> Fire the Bifrost, right? We're going to put a scratch on the flare of them. Yeah. yeah, tell the ship in there, Joe. Uh, we'll be back after we scratch this uh, ship of this guy we don't like. It's a 24 century equivalent to key in someone's car. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm willing to bet that after that massive uh, success that he just pulled off with getting through the eddies, that um, it's very likely that Caval, Caval manages to successfully pilot the Navis into a um, in, into a parallel. Is parallel the right word? Yeah. The parallel park. Yeah. Next to right next in, to the. He uh, comes the in at sort of like yeah. full impulse and then just handbrake <laughs> turns it into the. Uh... With Thazanan, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I love it how Matt's got this like unconditional kind of like confidence in Cabal and the rest yeah. of us just slag him off all the time. <laughs> I've seen his roles, so you know. 
so have we. It doesn't change the fact that we still question his ability as a pilot. Well, there you go. And that's why the shuttle gets scratched. <laughs> the vendetta. Cabal's just like, I ate him. I ate him all. <laughs> it's entirely up to you if you want to take the, the, the role anyway. If you'd still want to take the, the piloting check to see whether or not you do successfully manage to park it next to the, uh, what do they call it again? This thing is called the Starwood. You can, but we're I'm on, just saying you don't need we're to. Next momentum. Over. So I think uh, let's let's just let's just go with it. It's parked. No, oh, he hasn't got confidence yeah. in his own roles anymore. <laughs> uh, Captain, they're on the port dock. They're on the uh, port airlock. The Starwood oh, is on top. our port airlock. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's much harder to say the star the Starwood's on the starboard. <laughs> Star Wars on the Star, Star Wars, so, so, uh, um, the ship is on the They're right. They're on the port side. <laughs> Stick it on the left, on like the I say. Yeah. Andrews but takes out a little necklace from under a collar, opens it, looks at it, nods and goes, thank you, Commander. <laughs> well, you can see, the Star Wars on the starboard, remember, the pestle with the vessel is the blue that is true. Okay. You know, port used to be called Larbert. Yeah. Yes, yes, it did, didn't it? And I only know that, and I say no, I've only come across that from um, uh, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. So, uh, there you go. You did hear Larbert rather than um, Port, which is Ruby, and funnily enough, some of the crew members on board at the time. But anyway. All right, so you you've connected to the other ship, and you basically walk onto the other ship. You are escorted very quickly to the bridge in order to meet Commander Mounty. Is he Canadian? No. Yeah, by the look she. of them, he's by the look of them, they're Vulcans. Oh no! <laughs> so there is definitely no. a very Vulcan-like look to these people. No. They they have kind of a pale-ish complexion, pointed ears, and um, upward darting eyebrows. But they also um, they, they clothe themselves in kind of like um, ochre-coloured robes. But one of the physical characteristics that marks them as different from Vulcans is that their hands uh, appear to be webbed, slightly webbed between the fingers. And as soon as you guys come into the, uh, the, the bridge, Commander Mauti turns around, cracks an enormous smile of relief, and says, Oh, you're here at last, thank goodness. Yay. Praise the Iriax. Fake Romulans. You say that. No, that's internal monologue. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that. Absolutely, I don't say that. You pause time to do a captain's log, a captain's log supplemental. Uh, fake Romulus. <laughs> Almost as heavy a sigh as when you realised you were going on this first contact mission. Oh yes, uh. how much I love first contact missions. I actually had you coming in through the wrong door, my part. <laughs> you guys should have come in from got... this direction. So, once again, we got lost on the Navity. It's a new ship. <laughs> So yes, Commander Mounty turns around. Thank, thanks you profusely from um, for, for answering their their request for aid. Um, yeah. So Andrews will introduce, saying that uh, here we are in the United Federation planet. But then also request Lieutenant Turin to join on board the away team. Okay. And would ask the Doctor to start undertaking uh, assessments of the crew of the uh, Starbound. Star Ward. Star Ward, sorry. That's fine. Along with seeing whether there is any genetic markers that are similar to our non our non Romulan friends. <laughs> okay. Associates. Well um, 
Mitchell would probably try and do it subtly and ask if he can provide any medical support yeah. to any injured members of Mountie's crew, rather than just go, all right, just taking your jeans. <laughs> Stick your arm out. We need to make sure what you are. It's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit hard. A bit harsh, but we turn up and steal their clothes. <laughs> Take your it. jeans. Like, what? Because, well, Captain Mounty, um, if you want our help, you do have to attend a moss lecture. <laughs> uh, but no, um, Bertram will actually um, ask if there are any injuries, and if so, he obviously has helped uh, um, treat any. Absolutely, our, yeah. uh, our sick bay definitely need assistance at this point. Uh, if you could which don't... are their most critical systems? Very well. Um, Doctor, as far as your expertise is required, we have about 74 crew members aboard, many of them are wounded. 20 dead at last estimation. If uh, you direct me to where I need to go, I will begin work immediately with your leave. I will send one of my technical assistance specialists in order to escort you. At which point, Thank one you. of these detaches themselves from their console. Not literally detaches. <laughs> Let me quickly <laughs> make note. She, uh... <laughs> She, uh, you know, exits the, the, the chair and offers to escort Dr. Bertram to where the sick bay uh, appears to be. Uh, to do, to do. One of the things you notice about um, those of you who are still on the bridge at this point, one of the notice is that um, it's a sleek, very compact vessel. Everything seems to have been put in pl in in place in order to maximise. The, uh, the effectiveness of the space used. Everything's very much all, pretty much angles. So the bridge seems very, very small, very, very small in comparison to yours, but the space is very optimally designed. And a uh, good many of the consoles that you're near to, this will um, be picked up mostly by Edwards. Uh, but also by Nova, or with their, both of them having direct experience of it. The, the kind of language dialect, the, 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 the kind of runic um, written language that's appearing on the, uh, on the consoles, looks almost familiar. It looks almost Tilikal influenced, but not quite there. There are certain pictographs and ideograms in there that look very similar to the stuff you've seen before. But it's a similarity, not an, not a, an exact replica. Uh, Commander Mauti at this point kind of breaks the spell and says that the, if a more immediate concern is the fact that our FDL drive is damaged and we won't be able to proceed back to our home planet unless it's repaired and into a fashion that we can limp along back home. So we would appreciate any assistance you can give us with repairing our engines. And then of course, as uh, you're trying to figure out who you're going to send to their engineering section, she gives you all a good look up and down and it's a case of, I've never seen so many different species before. And you are all affiliated. Explain the Federation oh, and the Klingon Empire. Oh, two separate polities. Fascinating. So, whilst Andrews is going to be giving the talk of you know who we are and what we do, who is going to engineering and who is sticking around here having a look at the systems? Uh, Never would probably go to engineering. Well, um. I'm guessing Keth. <laughs> I was going to say, is Keth coming along as well? <laughs> I mean, Bertram is going to uh, sick bay. Do you want to take Natik along with? Uh, Natik has got medical experience, hasn't he? Yeah. He's got yeah. some oh, medical. Right, he, he had he had yeah. Bertram shouting in his ear in which bits to <laughs> which bits to cut and which bits not to. So yeah, if you qualify that as some medical experience. He has taken orders from uh, from Bertram before, so yeah, he can accompany Bertram. Um, I remember the, the knee bones connected to the thigh bone. 
So Andrews is sticking around with Commander Mounty for the time being. What are Ori, Edwards and Turin doing? I want Turin as a Vulcan to just see if there's any kind of similarities between if a Vulcan, to sort of like see whether she'd be able to confirm if this is a Vulcan like research branch that have evolved well, under Tilikau technology kind of requirements. Well, okay. as I say, web fingers would potentially designate to evolution to, to being vaguely aquatic or mm. amphibious. So, whilst Turin is trying to surreptitiously or blatantly um, investigate potential links to her own species, um, or I and Edwards proceeding down to engineering? Or is Edwards in Turin? Right. I mean, I'm, hap I'm happy to help on the identifying cultural roots front, but um, if the captain wants to be in engineering? I mean, Kath and Nova are going to engineering, so if Edwards wants to stick to where the interesting stuff is, and or I will probably go anywhere either either place, so hell, he'll knowing him, he'll probably start sticking on the bridge to hit on the crew. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of Ori. I think Ori would be on the bridge. Okay. I mean are you encouraging the hitting on or the <laughs> No. It's alright though. It's difficult to stop it. Yeah. Right. As long as we have Vulcan t decontamination protocols on the transporter, it'll be fine. Um, yeah, so, well, the one thing that does definitely strike you, uh, and, you know, Turin will, will echo this, is that the, these guys, as much as they may look like Vulcans, they are, they, they're definitely not stoic in the same fashion. They are, they are very free with their emotions, these folks, they're very glad to see you and they express it openly. Many of them, as as those of you who are going to both sick bay and the engineering section, as you're passing by these uh, these people, they are stopping what they're doing and they're looking at you in wide-eyed wonder, with looks of looks of fascination and genuine emotional interest in you in you all. So, you take the specialist away. So, Bertram, not cling, uh, not, um, go on, sorry. The Romulan descendants, not uh, Vulcan descendants. Maybe. I like them more. And then we have uh, Nova and... Come on, switch already. We have an officer. Officer, come on, switch already. Um, Nova and Keth go into engineering. Where's the entry bay to engineering? Okay, cool. So... In regards to pretty much everybody, you're noticing as you're moving through the ship, everyone who moves through the ship <clears throat> as you're investigating the place, you also get a real, real sense of economy of space and design. Um, the engineers amongst you are really impressed with the efficiencies noted into the design. Um, doing a quick calculation uh, Lieutenant Turin, kind of look, looking at the, the technology as much as the people, kind of estimates that the vessel, um, a, a, a Starfleet vessel, uh, would require about 30% more crew and resources. But these guys are doing with 30% less. So. Going to difficult places. Don't explode and kill the user at the moment. There's a slight power surge. <laughs> Alright, so let's get you to Adds to engineer's log. Um, uh, please replace uh, doctor's consoles if things that explode more easily. So as Bertram and uh, Natik enter, are escorted into uh, where the sick bay is, you find a single... Um, obviously the, the, the head doctor, there are a number of what look like stasis pods or medical pods of some variety dotted around the place. 
various bits of what you would think are the equivalent of uh, biomimetic gel canisters held around the place which are being used to try and assist with uh, helping the, treat the injuries of the crew. As the chief doctor notices you come in, his immediate response is to put down what he's doing and come over, but he then stops in his tracks as he realises that you're not a Karu crew. Good grief. So our distress signal was answered. Thank goodness. Yes. I'm Dr. Bertram of the USS Navis. I'm here to help in whatever medical facility I can. Oh, excellent. This is Ensign Natik. Natik just kind of waves. An insectoid sentient life form. Fascinating. Unfortunately, I don't have t time for proper introductions. Uh, I'm Curate Kalu. I'm uh, in charge of the medical bay here. If you are here to grant medical assistance uh, to my fellow crew members, then I will not deny them that assistance. Come, I can show you how to utilize our equipment. Very good, great. And I'll follow. So, what I would like out of Doc Bertram is a reason and medical task with difficulty of one, please. Uh, your okay. xenobiology will definitely help immensely. Okay, uh, just in case it's needed, I do have quick study, as this might be counted as an unfamiliar species. Definitely. Well, that's the weird thing. They look so Vulcan, and when you get, when you start examining the patients, their physiology yeah. is not that different from Vulcans at all. It's quite striking, but there's definite evolutionary drift. But nevertheless, one success. Wicked. Exactly what we needed. So, yes, the vestigial webbing between their fingers and their toes, apparently, seems to speak to, like, um, a bit of uh, uh, mutational drift. Treating these people gives you the opportunity, and this will be true as well for um, Turin and Edwards as they're um, examining the, rather surreptitiously or not, the, uh, the, the crew members where you guys are. Um, their DNA does suggest common ancestry with Vulcans and Romulans. Personality-wise, they seem to be very disciplined and enthusiastic, but you do notice that they are very openly friendly and uh, very free with their emotions. Let's steer us. So, yeah, obviously, any medical-related um, procedures take time to do, yeah. and, of course, you being careful and concise with them. But their similarities to Vulcans means that you're operating on a very a, a more familiar basis than you might otherwise be with a new species, so it's all good. <laughs> to engineering! So, again... Nova and Keth, the thing that strikes both of them is the compact yet very, very efficient nature of the, the build of the engineering section and everything going down there. One thing that is very striking, especially to Nova, is that at intermittent periods, wherever there are wall panels missing thanks to damage or buckling or whatever, you get a look at some of the... Um, the energy conduit systems and rather than using like the reinforced um, plasma piping that you get for your your, your EPS grids um, there's a lot more of distinct channels brought into the actual uh, build of the ship itself again in a very familiar fashion to how the Tilikal technology worked <laughs> it's still less exact as the Tilikal technology, it obviously has very, very definite similarities to it, but isn't exactly the same as Tilikal technology, but does use it in a very efficient fashion to transport power by kind of like weaving it into the actual metallurgy of the ship's hull itself. Again, making it a fiercely efficient design. But when you do get to the uh, Core room itself. One man um, steps forward and introduces himself as Specialist Jumai. He looks rather beleaguered, but it's very 
keen to meet the two of you. So Nova's empathic sense gets a very strong sense of someone who's um, stressed, who's also in slight mourning. There's a very heavy sense of sadness, probably from the loss of so many fellow crew members. And by the looks of the state of the place, it seems that engineering was one of the places who took the most damage. Um, so the people who are assisting him with uh, the engineering stuff are, uh, again, with Nova's empathic sense, you get the feeling of, they, they feel a bit like fish out of water, pardon the obvious pun, because they've got webbed fingers and toes, but um, they're, there's, they're, they're, they're science crew who have been brought on to do engineering tasks, and so when Specialist Jumai learns that Kef is an engineer and that Nova is very much an enthusiastic engineer, he welcomes you to of your assistance. And it is a very definite emotional sense of relief that he's got actual proper trained engineers to, to help with the repairs here. So, so, <laughs> so um, yeah, so if for, for, for Nova it's weird, because you can see outwardly they're very, very similar to Vulcans, but your, your, your empathic senses are registering regular folks' emotions. So usually um, it's a thing of having to look through the outer veneer, but it, you know these guys are open with their emotions, so it's yeah, weird. How similar are their minds in regards to like, the telecom and stuff that we've come in contact before? No similarities whatsoever. The, uh, the you know the other the, the Tilakal mines that you came in contact with before they were strange they were otherworldly they were bigger big and stronger yeah. and and very energetic but you also while you were there got the impression that they were <laughs> they were dimming the lights just so that you could see in a in kind of a sense but um, you always got the impression of these immense mines whereas these guys they're obviously very smart they're regular humanoids and therefore. Their intellects are, are bound to the confines of their physiology, just like yours. But nonetheless, smart folks, very much more along the lines of uh, Vulcans. But yes, definitely not anything remotely close to the actual Tilakal themselves. Cool beans. So, Nova and Kef assisting with repairs and having a look at their systems. This will be reason and engineering for both, so um, who fancies being Kef? Let's go with Davis, since you're usually doing engineering related stuff. Do you fancy being Kef? Kapwa? <laughs> Let's hope so. This is uh, Reason and Engineering, and he's got very good reason and reasonably good engineering. One of the things we're going to have to improve in the future. Is he assisting or is he rowing yes. on his own? I imagine he's assisting. <laughs> oh, okay. Nova, Nova will be leading this, what with his superior engineering. Um, he can't use his value. No, he can't. Because <laughs> he's been explicitly told today is not a good day to die. But Because the calendar using, has been checked. He's using his <laughs> brain smarts. Today is a day that ends in a Y. It is not a good <laughs> to die. <laughs> what rhymes with die? Why? Try. <laughs> As in try not to. So, Nova can give me reason engineering too. You can use two dice and obviously um, your Tilical familiarity will come into, uh, come into play here and of course tinkering technology and inner workings make for good foci too. So, use Trevor one you fancy. Cool. So, Keth very much follows Nova's lead and is kind of hovering over Nova's shoulder. He's very interested in what Nova's doing, so it's a case of, oh, I see what you did there. Interesting. Are you sure you want to? Oh, never mind. Okay, you did it anyway. <clears throat> oh, good grief, it worked. I might have to try that one of these days. Interesting. She'd probably be berating him as she's doing it to be more daring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hands <laughs> off, you <laughs> fool. You give me, give me clumsy fingers. And that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. 
berating him, but with a smile on her face. I just kind of picture in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> really cheerily doing so. <laughs> How do you cheerily <laughs> tell somebody they suck? <laughs> <laughs> like a psychopath. <laughs> like nice, I interesting mental picture I got going on. Oh, foot! You're very cheerily being patronising. <laughs> you're doing really well. <laughs> Have a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you start patching together the system, and it's pretty badly damaged. You don't reckon you're going to get much out of this. Um, they're probably not going to be capable of, of, of light speed travel anytime soon. This FTL system is... It's, it's not exactly primitive. It's new. And it's obviously um, this species, the, the, these guys first foray into interstellar space because it shows a degree of newness and lack of experience that suggests what I've just said. So there's a lot of novelty involved, but the way they've gone about it, considering that this seems like one of one of the first forays into interstellar space they've taken, the the way they've gone about designing the, the, their primary, uh, let's call it a warp core, for lack of anything else, um, is really interesting. Again, the whole thing seems revolved around being compact, energy efficient, um, but it's taken a hell of a whack, and as a result you don't think you're going to be able to fix it sufficient to give the warp power. So if these guys are going to get home, it's more than likely going to be a tow job. You're going to probably need to tow them back to their planet. But overall... Can we guess what the top on. speed would be? Probably at most warp five, if they pushed it. That's pretty good going for. Yeah, exactly. So it's again, if I haven't impressed upon it enough, it's it's really, really impressive for a first-time species to have created something with that much uh, warp capability as one of one of their probably first forays into it. Nevertheless, um, repairs, overall structural integrity is a lot better now that you can actually feed power through the system. Um, banging out the dents can probably be done in transit, as it were, but the ship is, pro is under no more um, risk of failure of any of its systems, thanks to Nova and Keth. So, do 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 do. Meanwhile, back on the bridge, Ori and the captain speaking with Commander Mounty. You, you know, uh, explain the Federation, which Commander Mounty is really fascinated with. The idea that not only are there aliens, but there are multitudes of aliens, and they're all cooperating greatly. And she's really fascinated with that. She states readily that um, her own people, the Akaru. Um, exist on a planet that's mostly lots of lots of individual islands, lots of archipelagos. But um, thanks to the Iriax, and it's not clear who or what the Iriax appears to be in any kind of context yet. Sure, no. uh, it sounds like a leader, maybe. Not sure. According to uh, Commander Mauti, the Iriax united all the pe all, all the Akaru people so that they all cooperated with one, one another rather than fighting each other for resources. As a result, it's allowed their, their culture to thrive and especially for their space programs to advance very, very quickly. Now their home planet is apparently a planet called Setu which is about three days away at Warp 5. <clears throat> but if the uh, if the, the Starwood were allowed to limp its own way home, it would take them a, a week, maybe more, to limp their way there. Mm -hmm. 
so it's entirely up to you whether or not you fancy um, letting them get underway themselves or if you fancy literally towing them back to their home planet. Your ship's certainly big enough to take them without any problem. I think we have a duty of care to return them to their home planet. Um, like I said, such a journey would take three days at warp five. So uh, you can help effect repairs with your repair Couple of hours sometime. at warp six. What was that, sorry? Couple of hours at warp six. More like a uh, day and a half at warp six, maybe. But given the gravitational anomalies in this section, sector of space, pardon me, you'd probably need to throttle it down anyway <laughs> in order to safely navigate those. So I think it's worthwhile we, we inform Admiral Heber of the situation, but advise her that um, we have a potential Tilikau lead. And the I'll pass it on, Captain. Planet. Might be worthwhile. <laughs> would, would it be possible to start comparing this schematic to our known telecom technology? Yeah. And see just how much of an influence it's had. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Do we want to plug you in hello into it and see what happens? <laughs> Not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> Is that restraint Sorry, that, sounds, that sounds like restraint and uh, sensible precautions of Nova. Yeah, I'll um, I declare a medical emergency. <laughs> we considered the fact that the Tilical influence might not have been from the Tilical, but from the Splinter group. That's what I'm thinking, that's yeah. why it's in it. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay. So. Uh, after a few hours of shared effort with the engineering crew and the medical uh, medical team as well, the Starwood looks about as ready as it's ever going to be to get underway. It's now safe to tow it without the thing falling apart from stress. And thanks to uh, Thazanan's mapped out the safe routes through the gravitational eddies, charting a course out to Setu is no problem at all. It'll take, like I said, few days to get there, during which time you can... well, that's that's a good question. Are you, uh, you going to confine them to their ship, or are you maybe going to use those diplomatic suites that you've got on your ship? Oh yeah, li limited access. They can have access to the diplomatic suites. Cool. The bar. The bar. <laughs> <laughs> Ten deck. <laughs> yeah, they, they and can of be course, the holodeck deck on the entertainment deck. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put them in holodecks. Uh, they, Why? They have access to because ha it's a holodeck. They've probably never had holo technology. They okay, can have access. Great. To ten, yeah, they can have access to ten deck and the diplomatic suites, like you say. Probably some of the senior bridge crew will be allowed to see the bridge, but yeah, no touchy. <laughs> no touchy. Okay, so we come back to the bridge of the Navis. So, we're heading out with uh, the Star Ward in tow. Commander Mauti is, of course, extremely uh, enthusiastic about coming to see your ship, and of course, when she uh, when when um, she looks out of a viewport, as you indicate, you know, there's our ship. Have a look. She's, you know, and everyone else of her people on the bridge are stunned at the sheer size of your ship. But of course, um, the uh, the link to your from your ship to theirs is pulled free, and a track to beam established, and the uh, the Star Ward is guided out. When it's safe to do so, you can, of course, beam delegates from their ship onto yours. Naturally. Um, security protocols would dictate that with um, and first contact protocols would dictate that you know you extend them every courtesy and that they can use the diplomatic suites but as you have quite rightly pointed out there's also a security issue since you don't know what side of the coin they fall onto as of yet so um, restricting their access means that they need security teams near them so uh, Bravo and Chief of Security Bravo will, of course, be uh, assigning 
himself and whatever uh, uh, extra security teams are needed to escort or stay very close to whichever delegates are allowed to come on board. So, uh, Commander Mauti and the others never get a view of the bridge or engineering or anything like that. It is confined to the diplomatic diplomatics uh, deck. That's a question. Where is the diplomatic get deck again? It is deck eleven. So way past your dark matter drive. So, in the three days yeah. it takes, yeah, sorry, go on. So yeah, keep them in there. Keep Do them in let there. them see the dark matter drive? Nah. No. Smoking have... device. <laughs> No, they're not looking like a device. Um, I think we do want to show them, at least let them glimpse engineering, but not stay, and yes. probably show them the bridge, just because you showed yours, his, ours yeah. type thing without giving away too much. Okay. Everybody cool with that? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Alright, brilliant. So, yes, obviously, Commander Mauti, when she's brought on to, and any of her delegation are brought onto the bridge, they, you know, stunned shocks um, on their, you know, stunned and enthusiastic looks on their faces. Oh, good grief, this is so big. But then the, you notice they start looking, as, as they start just quietly regarding things, they, they start s swapping notes between each other and... Um, those who are near enough to hear could just basically hear that they're, they're, there's the swapping notes of, in, in, in an engineering sense, it's a case of, hmm, maybe if they use this instead, then they might increase their efficiency output by about 3.5%. If instead of having them all clustered in this uh, across the entire deck, maybe if they brought some people in into different areas and, and shortened the distance between certain consoles, they might be able to accomplish a bit more, blah blah blah, and it goes on like that. So they're not they're, they're critiquing, but they're doing it in in a way that's not meant to offend. They're obviously a very, very bright folk, and everything they're looking at, they're looking at from the lens of, of, of science and engineering, it seems. Um, but they're very curious about all the different uh, species, and of course, they've only had a snapshot of, the, of how many species are in the Federation, so when they're fully brought on board, and see just how many there are, they're all pretty much gobsmacked by the variety of crew that you've got. So, unless uh, otherwise stated, I'm going to assume that standard um, diplomatic uh, protocol is observed, where you basically explain once again the Federation and the Federation's mission, and the fact that you've made up of member states, technically, now that um, they have been found to be a warp-capable species, an extension for membership of the Federation can technically be made. Likewise, uh, Commander Mauti expresses that uh, they've only really explored their home system for the last, uh, the last couple of decades. Uh, which has allowed them to make leaps and bounds in uh, correcting their uh, faster than light travel. Still, those of you who are keeping it probably quiet to yourselves, it's still remarkable how much progress they seem to have made in such a subjectively short amount of time. But as to the prospect of potential future membership with the Federation, uh, Commander Mounty does suggest that, that kind of thing is definitely out of her hands. That would be more in the line of members of her society who she seemed to call the Akaruback. And she explains that um, the Akaru society seems split off into designated uh, functions. So it seems that their, their whole ethos of um, efficiency seems to not only extend to their technology, but also to their society as a whole. You get the distinct impression that um, 
their whole society revolves around efficiency and intercooperative inter efficiency. As such, they seem to have assigned themselves into various roles. Um, there are things like specialists, um, but individuals who are assigned to things uh, that are more to do with the physical sciences are called curates. <clears throat> specialists are more to do with technology. It seems that the, the political class, if you can indeed call them that, are the Akaru back, but from the way that Commander Mauti talks about them, it seems that they're also something of a a religious uh, priest class, almost. And they seem to be subservient, or at the very least, the the next level down from somebody called, or somebody or something called, the Iriax. And again, from the language that Mauti is using, it's unclear whether Iriax is a an official kind of political title or if it's a religious title. It seems to be lie somewhere in between. So the linguists and the xeno anthropologists on your crew kind of get the impression that they're a society who seem to they're a very obviously stratified society, but it seems to be almost like a pyramidal structure where there's definitely somebody at the top of this Iriax, whoever or whatever they are, seems to be at the tippy top. And seems to serve a function societally as both a religious icon and as the primary um, ruler of the society, the leader. So, as far as their technology goes, um, Mauti is more than happy for you to have a look at their technology. And you get pretty much the same kind of impression that I've already stated. Definitely very heavy influence of Tidakal technology, or at the very least te technological practices. Societally, though, nothing that seems to suggest anything to do with uh, the Tidakal as such. Uh, my question to you now becomes, do you offer up the inference of the potential um, genetic similarity to... I mean, you've already got Lieutenant Turin, who's right there and is already... Um, shown herself along with some of your other Vulcan crew members, there's an obvious resemblance. So, I don't know whether you broached that subject with the Akaru or not. Sorry, whether you talked there. Yeah, I think we would, but it's subtle, and it's more right. the case that we want to find out about do they know what their origins were? Are they all Have they always come from Planet Siri? Or do they believe that they've come from other places? And then just say why we're suggesting that. Okay. Well, um, yeah, as far as Mounties, Mounties seems to feel no, no offence to that kind of question whatsoever. She's, in fact, she seems strangely, um, not exactly nonplussed about it, but you get the impression, especially the, the empaths and telepaths amongst you, get the impression that she kind of came to that conclusion herself the moment she started, you know, looked at Lieutenant Turin. The, the, the obvious resemblance, scientifically speaking, would suggest that there might be a shared heritage there somewhere. So, as far as cultural history goes, uh, Mauti mentions that the Akaru believe that uh, they were a people who were in chaos, but were uplifted by the presence of the Iriax, and therefore, whether or not there is any actual link between the Akaru and the Vulcans, and maybe these people that you call the Romulans, Mauti yourself has no knowledge of, but if you were to maybe speak with the Akaru back or the Iriax, they might be able to tell you. She does seem to hint, though, that speaking with the Iriax themselves, and she does use the word the Iriax themselves, um, would have to be something that would be that would have to go through the Akaru back. 
But seeing as if you do choose to, when you when we eventually reach their planet Setu, um, if you choose to make diplomatic ovations too and introduce yourselves to the Akaru, then in all likelihood um, the Akaru back will want to extend uh, a diplomatic greeting to you and. More than likely, you might very well get an audience with the uh, with the Iriax. And so, is there anything specific? Sorry, Webby, you just talked there, so I talked over you, so I'm going to apologise for that and let you talk again. It's alright. I think it would be one of our best ways to actually confirm our suspicions of whether the the Ariax are Tilakau. Okay. So, um, however subtly or bluntly you choose to phrase that, uh, Marty will of course say that you know she's just a she's just a commander. But due to the fact that they're going to be bringing guests from multiple different species from a galactic federation to visit, for the, to make first contact essentially with the Ikaru, uh, Marty's fairly certain that. Yakaro back at the very least will want to talk to you, so a, uh, an audience with the Eriax will probably have to be arranged. And you can decide for yourselves. So, does any do you have anything else that you would like to accomplish during those three days that you spend escorting the Yakaru to their home planet? Isn't there ship? Oh, sorry, Davis, I think I jumped in there. No, Does God, you're going to ask a sensible question. <laughs> Does their ship have any kind of like weapon capabilities, or is it mainly just an exploration vessel? Um, let me have a look. I get the general impression that it is mostly an exploration vessel, but they do have weapon systems. In fact, when you investigate the weapon systems, they seem to have energy weapons consistent with disruptor arrays. Interestingly enough, rather than going for what most early spacefaring cultures would have gone for with something that's more photonic in nature, these guys have developed a, uh, a torpedo system that has tremendous similarities to your quantum torpedoes. Sorry. One other thing I'd want to do during this three days is okay. I'd like to see if we can get their star charts mm. Mm. Yep. and compare them with what we know of the of the uh, Shackleton Expanse. Okay. Yep. No problem. Uh, that's very easy to get. They're well, more than willing to give their limited star charts away. Most of their stellar navigation charting has been done basically from their own planet or their own system with um, satellites and sensors and whatnot so they've got a very singular view of the uh, of the surrounding uh, star systems which you know is understandable again the sheer amount of detail they can cap they seem to have captured just from observation alone is rather impressive but uh, these do match up with uh, what long-range sensors have managed to ascertain um, of the Shackleton Expanse. This area does seem to match their their um, their own national navigational maps. And then I'm gonna do a little science experiment Go on. with the captain's approval. I'd like to give them a copy of the of the uh, data around the eddies and the paths that uh, Kavala's mapped out on the very nearby to where we found them. Well, they can because use I want to see how much they do themselves and what they do to that and whether this high resolution is because of years and years of scanning or it's how they process it. Because that tells us whether they're doing it in the computers and it's simulated or whether it's real. 
After a couple of days of processing this data surreptitiously or, co or overtly, uh, I will leave that up to yourselves. Um, it appears to be the, the the advanced nature of their sensor equipment that has allowed them to take such accurate uh, astro navigational charts of their nearby space. So it's more down to, again, their fierce efficiency and uh, the creation of their advanced, somewhat advanced technology that's uh, served them in being able to uh, create re really good, really accurate maps of their surrounding stars, star system. So, mm. unless there's something else anybody else wants to bring up during that, those three days of travel, And I am going to say that after those three days, you do eventually come into the system where their homeworld is uh, currently set, or rather set to. Uh, you haven't been idle, of course. It's not just been the diplomatic um, overtures that you've been extending. You have been helping them repair their ship as you go. Uh, so your vessel breaks out of warp alongside the Star Ward. Together, the two vessels cruise towards Setu, which is a lush Class M planet with expansive oceans and two large continents. Sensors indicate that Setu is a robust industrial world with one large shipyard and spaceport located on the southern continent. Commander Mounty informs you that your team may transport to the planet's surface and provides you the coordinates to the exterior plaza of the palace grounds of Setu's ruler, the Iriax, also called the Iriax Nadeon. And I think that is where I'm going to stop things for tonight. You have now been extended uh, basically a diplomatic pass to go down onto the uh, the surface in order to conduct basically first contact with the head of head of the Akaru government. So how you go about that, we'll have to wait until next time. But uh, key to this is the fact that next week we are due if you're up for it, you guys, to, ex uh, to uh, extend out our resolution of this until not next week, but the week after. Unless, of course, you do actually want to carry straight on from where we are, but uh, we had thought to maybe intersperse this with our Doctor Who one-shot. So, I extend to you the choice, uh, since this is your game, do you mind stopping uh, and just uh, doing the, uh, the Doctor Who one-shot next week, which I know Mike would be up for, or would you prefer to carry this straight on through, since we've already started? Up to you guys, what do you think? I'm happy to break for the Doctor Who one-shot. I'm not part of the one-shot, so I... It's whatever you decide to do. Val, are you alright if we break off to do the Doctor Who one shot for a week? Val. No. Yan, I'm I'm imprinting too much of your character on you, man. <laughs> I apologize. If only if only I could fly. I believe you could fly. No, um Yan, it's entirely as, as long as you're you okay with um with <laughs> skipping over the resolution until the week after. It's all good. All good? Alrighty. Sean, you up for Doctor Who next week, or are you abstaining from Doctor Who? Uh, I don't think I'm in it now, so... What was that, sorry? I don't think I'm in it now. Oh, okay. So, is it just myself, Webby, Mike? Um, I've got... Yourself, Webby, and Davis. Mike hasn't actually come back to me or given me any details, so okay. I don't Might be know worth if he's... prodding him over Discord there yeah. in that case. Okie dokie. Because he seems like a big fan of Doctor Who, so we'll see what's going on. Okay. Yep. 
Maybe getting a pre-generated character to work with. In any case, uh, we seem to, in that case, be uh, alright with breaking for a week in order to do the Doctor Who one-shot, which will be GM'd not by myself, but by Gareth here. I apologise in advance. <laughs> so, um, this will be a, another one of our... Dream. Another one of our RPG showcases where we will show a different system in action. I will be playing for a change. So, um, yeah. We'll see what kind of a mess we'll, I make of Gareth's plans. <laughs> it's fine. Matt, uh, as, some, as someone who has actually played in the game I GM before, I'm sure he can assure people that I like very, very straightforward and not at all esoteric games. <laughs> in case you didn't pick up on the heavy sarcasm there, guys. Um... <laughs> I once um, GM'd the game that Matt was part in, where the entire thing was a group of people go to a hotel. And then yeah. they leave the next day. <laughs> mm. That was that was a trip. And I, I mean that. That was an actual trip. <laughs> no I could have involved. taken I could have taken psychoactive chemicals and it would have made <laughs> just as much sense. But no, that was good. I do it. That, that was that was cool that what you did, so looking forward to it. Well, I hope so. I hope it lives up to everyone's expectations who's taking part in it. Well, you know, it's 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 one thing to play in a Doctor Who game and also to, to also um, showcase the Doctor Who game's rules. So it's yes. for other folks' benefit as well. There are other games than Dungeons and Dragons around these days. So yeah, cool. In I, that case, I hear there's a good Star Trek one going around. Mm. Yeah, I do you, right. <laughs> Let's not forget that um, second edition of Star Trek Adventures is currently. I think they're already making it, if not. Already, um... Coming soon. Yeah, it's, it's definitely coming soon. I don't know what kind of time frame Modi Modifius have got with their second edition of Star Trek Adventures, but I didn't realize it's been around since 2017. So... In the before times. Yeah, good on them for, for, um, for keeping this up, because they, they still keep releasing, um, like, what, uh, adventure ideas, mission ideas and stuff, um, constantly. I mean, I made note at the beginning of this session about the Klingon Federation War uh, module that they've released. So, good on them, Modifius. You, you're doing really well with this stuff. So one can only imagine what kind of Im improvements and changes are on the horizon when um, Second Edition comes through. Our ability to take up Second Edition, of course, is entirely incumbent upon um, whether or not found we, we have a, a Foundry uh, ability to play it. So we'll see how we do. How it goes, but that's for the future. For the immediate future, of course, we'll be taking a break from Star Trek Adventures for next week and going into the Doctor Who thing. Star Trek Adventures Navis will continue the uh, Tuesday after that. We'll go straight back into where we leave off here with the diplomatic investigation into the Akaru and what's going on. Until that time, I would very much like to thank my crew here for another fun game. <laughs> Especially the shenanigans we got up to with you figuring out the ins and outs of your new ship. In the meantime... They'll never find out how to read paperwork again. <laughs> In the meantime, I will ask uh, everybody to uh, look after themselves, to do like the Vulcans do. And I don't mean have a weird offshoot of your species with webbed fingers and toes. No, no, you don't need to go that far. All you need to do is to live long and prosper and to engage in infinite diversity in infinite combinations. This world is currently going mad. So, things that uh, give us a little bit of time away from all that madness, like Star Trek and role-playing games in general, it's always a good thing to just basically take us away from all that craziness for a little bit longer. So if you do enjoy it and enjoy seeing this kind of content, then if you want to be watching this over YouTube, then please consider giving us a like uh, and also subscribe to our videos so you know when they come out, just so that we can put this into our Lord and Master, the algorithm. All hail All the algorithm. Hail. <laughs> so that it can help not just ourselves, but everybody else who's doing actual plays of role-playing games and promote more Star Trek. Especially with the final season of Discovery on the horizon. So, thank you very much for watching, uh, no, folks. So I'm watching Brave New Worlds. Uh, so Strange better. New Worlds, is, I'm really looking forward to as well when they eventually get it, because they left me on a cliffhanger, dammit! I've 
not got that far yet. I've only watched the first few episodes. Oh, watch as much as you can of Strange New Worlds. I do recommend. Uh, Captain it's, Pike it's is definitely worth it for me and Tracy now. to watch. So, folks, yeah, thanks Captain for watching, Luke. and we will see you next time. For the meantime, the stream is now hailing frequencies closed. Thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves, folks.